People who get locked into a vision. All right, that's it, man. That's their drive. That's their passion. Critics don't matter. This don't matter. They're going to do whatever it fucking takes to be the best at what they do. This is Dave Tate with another edition of Table Talk to talk about whatever. So I will let Joe and Janice start it off. Okay. So uh, I listened to the Justin Harris podcast last week. And actually something that we started to get into on that, or you guys started to get into, uh, Dave, was discussion of kind of idols that people grew up watching, um, you know, maybe superheroes, whatever, and how that motivated them. Uh, and, you know, we, we talked about it after the podcast and you were like, yeah, that was really cool. We could have gone into that a little bit, but listen, like we had other things to talk about, but I kind of want to circle back to it because I feel like, you know, you were like, oh man, there's, you know, there's social media and there's people watching people, there's people watching athletes and, how is that motivating people? And is this actually a good part of, you know, social media, which is getting damned so much on a regular basis? So I was wondering if we could kind of circle back to that and talk about mm -hmm. it a little bit. Yeah, I'll jump off with my viewpoint on what I've seen. The, um, before the podcast with Justin, I was on a working vacation, I suppose you can say, for three weeks. So watching a lot of different videos and a lot of podcasts and so forth and the one thing that kept popping up was I remember Jay Cutler was one of them saying that I don't know if it was Arnold or Stallone or those movies inspired him you know when he was younger to be you know great at what he does and Kai Green obviously with the comic book heroes John Meadows with the comic book heroes and it just kept going on and on and on with everybody that I'm listening to from even Eddie Hall talking about Arnold again and all these movie characters and I'm thinking to myself because I've read tons of leadership self-help type books and all of them say don't watch TV I'm like well just imagine if all these people didn't watch TV they would all be like really great rock science majors you know not making fun of you know that in any way whatsoever but they wouldn't have had anybody to look up to aspire to. And the interesting thing with this is it's not just in strength sports, but business, you know, every, every, how many people were inspired by the movie Wall Street to be a broker or, you know, Mad Men or whatever to go into business or whatever it is. <clears throat> the, and even the magazines, if you go back, before social media, there was a magazine you're looking through. I'd look through the bodybuilding magazines, even Powerlifting USA, and be like, wow, that's what I want to do. But then there's this impression that's left that they're all living luxurious lives. You know, that's not saying that they're broke as fuck. And um, so the, the full story isn't being told because the story's being told, the whole narrative is being told by muscle mag, um, weeder, you know, all the different publications that are telling the story of the athlete, even the columns and MD, you know, <laughs> Dennis Weiss, I think it was, was one of the writers for MD. And some of the columns were done by the athletes. So I don't want to take that away from them. Most of them were done by people like Dennis writing under the athlete's name. So you think here you know this athlete, but you don't because that entire narrative is being set up by the magazine to be able to put out what they need to put out to create the impression that they want, which ended up being the impression that motivated these people to grow up to become Mr. Olympia or whatever it's gonna be. But TV is bad. You know, the magazines are bad. So now you flip it to all that being false narrative, you know, basically it's in the movies, obviously, you know, that's not bad. And the news cycles were long. So you didn't even know if like Arnold, you thought was the greatest person in the world. You know, yeah, everybody wanted to be like Arnold. Then he, you know, bangs the maid, mm -hmm. you know, gets the maid pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's like, oh, maybe, maybe that's not who I should be looking up to. 
you know, with the exception of what Dennis Rodman coming out saying, look, dude, I shouldn't be anybody's idol. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody should look up to me, just not me. But they still do. But even back then, the newspapers, Sports Illustrated, uh, ESPN, all the news, they were creating the narrative of who these people were. Would Jordan still be the number one, you know, greatest of all time had some of his shit popped up? that we don't know, you know? And so now we're in a day where we have that narrative being controlled by whoever the athlete is, which is social media. So even on a smaller scale with Elite FTS, when we brought people on before social media, we have, um, you know, a sponsor manual. Here's kind of what you can say, what you can't say. And it's, very open it's not saying you have to do this you have it's just saying just don't be an asshole but one of the one of the things would be don't <laughs> we encourage and don't want anybody talking about anabolics and if people want to know why they can go search dave tate peds on youtube and there's a full explanation i don't need to go into that but at that time people would look up to the lifters on the site it's called being it's aspirational marketing so they want to be like them so you want them to come back to the site because they want to follow these people because they want to be like these people but yet we are telling them basically what to post you know on their training logs post your training post a little bit about your life you know you mm -hmm. don't need to go into all the details and we really didn't monitor and track hard or anything like that but it's still being controlled because it's under an elite FTS brand, which comes with a certain impression that puts it out there. Where now <laughs> it's just full 100% responsibility of the individual. So if you want to know who um, Dexter Jackson is, follow him. You know, how much of it's real? You know, well, it's kind of hard to be fake 100% of the time. Um, and I'm sure some is. But that brings up the question of who, who would you rather control the narrative, the actual individual or a corporation that has corporate interest in mind, mm -hmm. where the individual has corporate interest in mind too. And I could keep going on and on about this because the more diluted the individual is, if they have corporate interest in mind, you know, to be able to make money, the more and more sponsors that they start adding to their portfolio, the more and more they're diluting it. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what's going to end up is they're going to find the influencers. They have no influence is what they're going to find. And then companies are going to start putting their money back into advertising means that have better metrics of tracking from that standpoint. But I found it odd because even today people say, still don't watch the TV type of thing. But, but, but now it's not TV, it's not the media. The mm -hmm. media is social media. Now, today, it's stay off social media. Well, should they? <laughs> yeah, or should they not? You see what I'm saying? So I, found, I, I don't really have a stance on it because it was just more of a, wow, this is kind of fucking interesting because it was so influential to so many people. I mean, Vision Quest, how many people up their wrestling game because of lunatic fringe mm -hmm. and vi actually vision quest tied itself to lunatic fringe so every time you hear lunatic fringe you're like fuck i need to go do some drop steps right now mm -hmm. and then you're like going around the street you know going around your backyard for an hour and a half you know which brings up another point of do the influencer today have that much influence because see they were telling a real story Mm -hmm. where now the story that's being told is just the life, you know, people rambling stuff. So that's the kickoff. And that's, that's exactly like what uh, I would focus on off of everything that you just said. It's not a matter of like vetting the information that you're taking in or, or uh, uh, changing who you follow or monitoring who you follow. Cause I, I know a lot of people that are like, you only, only follow people that bring positivity to you, like control your social media feed because you are 
it it affects the way you see the world and if you take in negative information constantly or if you hate follow people it's going to negatively impact your life and all this stuff and then you have the other camp that argues well i want to follow everything so that i know what is happening i can i can see who i should be looking up to who i should be uh striving to be like or anything like that but what Dave just said was uh, it's a matter of taking in that information, but also seeing what the information it actually is, because the word you said right there is storytelling. I would say like TV, social media, media, whatever, whatever we can follow, the people that are like, stay off those things, don't watch, don't watch TV, don't watch, don't scroll social media. They aren't arguing to not do that. They're arguing not to look at the, the superficial versions of those things like don't just watch uh reality tv don't just watch uh like talk shows don't just watch the stuff that is just a space filler don't use your phone as an hour of time just to do nothing and not follow anything it's a matter of you learning uh and actually trying to get something off of it and i can't really it there are positives and negatives to both sides because some people are capable of doing that. Other people are not capable of doing that. But I think like lunatic fringe, uh, that every, every time that song plays, I immediately think of vision quest. I think about getting my ass kicked in, uh, the district tournament and then after the district tournament driving back from like brighton for three hours coming back and then killing myself with a workout in our weight set in the basement and just blasting music because i was so pissed off i never wanted to lose again and then i went uh what like 48 and two my senior year after that and it was it that I, I identify and I, I relate those things to to the stories that I've seen. It's the storytelling, and like I know you guys went into the comic book heroes and whatnot, but I could I could I, I know a lot of people my age, like the mid twenties, uh, grew up with Dragon Ball Z, mm -hmm. and uh, like I, I immediately think went my whole thing on like pride, like pride and ownership, and I am who I am, and I'm proud of it. I'm not. I'm trying not to be pr prideful. But I'm trying to like respect what I've accomplished and know I'm capable of more. It's Vegeta. You guys probably have no idea who that is, but there are people out there that are like, "Holy shit, that's exactly what it is," and they identify with that because it's storytelling. It's not just a hollow, um, a hollow intake of of nothing for 30 minutes. It's following along and seeing and identifying that like that is or are characteristics that I want to be like. And when, uh, like with Schwarzenegger, he, uh, everybody looked up to him because in, I'm not saying because of this, but in Pumping Iron, it's like telling a story. It sets up two figures, like Schwarzenegger versus Ferrigno, and it, it portrays them in a certain light, and they want to, it, it makes people identify with either or. And then we see that he, bangs the maid gets her pregnant like gets divorced and it's like oh shit maybe we don't want to look up to him as much as we do but that's the problem with uh with either not social media but just uh people in general we tend to only see other individuals in an idealized aspect we see what we want to see think of any any relationship you've ever been in think of your parents think of whomever you see someone and you're like oh well they have a good heart but then they also might be a shit bag a lot of the time, you know, but then, oh, but they have a good heart. And then that's how you get in abusive relationships and stuff like that. And I know a lot of people are like the whole Larry wheels thing, you know, and somebody asked me like it, it, somebody asked me like, is, is Larry Williams ever going to be on the podcast? And I'm like, I fucking hope not. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. Like that's, so many people, and I don't even know if you know the entire backstory behind that or if you do either, but or not the backstory, but just what was posted, but uh, his ex-girlfriend posted this thing, and it's a lot of people are like, well, oh, well, we need to wait to hear two sides, we need to wait to hear two sides, and it's, there are so many people, he still has 1.4 million followers, and people idolize individuals and, and idolize the human being just for their athletic accomplishments. You can be a fantastic athlete and a piece of shit at the mm. same time. 
you can be a fantastic person and be the worst athlete ever. You know, those, those things are not, it, it, you, you don't have to have both. And that's the problem when we, with social media these days is we can't really see that all the time. And because there is an aspect of faking it, and just putting because you get to choose the individual gets to choose what they want to put out there they don't have to put everything out there some people do some people are very transparent because it helps them and then therefore it helps other people like i talk about how i go to therapy and how i make mistakes and all that stuff but it's at the same time i don't lay it all out there because it's personal mm -hmm. you know and it's a lot of people just won't do that because it opens up the possibility that they'll be hurt. So that's on the that's on the aspect or on the side of the person actually posting. But then the people taking in that information, they're not going to see all of it. So if someone just posts about how they think they're the best in the world, they think they're going to succeed no matter what, they can do anything. And if you follow me, if you buy this program, if you come to this seminar, you can do it too. That's how you get cult followings and you get people that are always going to support them even if there's audio that comes out where it's like i'll fucking kill you you dumb bitch and then they're like well we need to hear both sides and it's like do we really <laughs> you know like i because i i don't know about you guys but i was raised in a household where it's like if you sp if you said that to another human being doesn't really matter what they did to you like if, if i i that's how i operate but i don't know so it's just vetting information and realizing where the information is coming from because we're all people and not everybody is going to post all of their stuff and yeah. not everybody is going to hear all the things that are posted either. I'll make a short statement and then let Janice talk. But you said it's, you know, how you were raised. And it's funny because this morning, because it's, I kind of know what Janice threw out as her ideas yesterday on what we would be discussing. I was raised at a time where, you know, I, we were taught you never talk religion, you never talk money, and you never talk politics. And mm -hmm. that's all anybody talks about anymore. So mm -hmm. it's so odd how just 25, 30, no, I'm 50. So say 30 years, you know, 40 years is like a complete pivot to where you don't talk about these things unless you really know the person mm -hmm. because it, it can fuck up your relationship mm -hmm. it can fuck up your business it can do all these different things and now it seems like it's the only thing anyway everyone wants to talk about so you i'm actually i'm just going to circle back for a second um to the i mean specifically to the larry wheel situation um because honestly when we're talking about idolizing people when we're talking about ideals that one was such an amazing example and i hate talking about that because it's so clinical and cold but of what i think we're facing you know in a world in which we have you know people who have mass followings athletes i'm gonna say athletes who have mass followings on social media um you know what i ended up saying around that time i actually like wrote a little thing and i posted some stories is like okay um this guy you know there's stuff that's come out here and you know it's pretty ugly i mean i don't know if it's true but the the fact is it's pretty ugly and it's i am really horrified by it and what i think is that you know human exemplary human athletes are actually a dime a dozen i know that we're like literally sitting on a podcast that wants to try to you know elevate everybody to to like the highest level possible so for me to say um okay you know if you're genetically blessed you're like a dime a dozen. There, there are many, many, many actually human beings out there who have the, the physical potential to reach a really, really high level. Sometimes they do choose to do so. Sometimes they don't. Um, but so when that stuff blew up, I immediately, I mean, for, I got to admit right now, um, like Larry Wheels kind of bored me partially because of what I'm saying, which was, um, is there anything else to you? Uh, you're not really putting a whole lot else um, out there other than like these little physical feet clips and like, you know, those are a dime a dozen. I can find people anywhere who honestly, who do pretty cool physical things, but what else are you about? So you get somebody, you get somebody who falls, okay? Like they're, they're put on a pedestal and then they fall. They have something that challenges their place on a pedestal. And 
what I say is like, if that happens and if you're severely disappointed in somebody, you don't have to like find somebody else who is an exemplary athlete because there will always be exemplary athletes. But like, what else do they bring to your mental sphere? Personally, I, you know, I know that I understand the argument in the opposite direction. It's like, I just really like to watch cool people doing physical things that are super cool. I'm going to watch that. I'm like, all right, I mean, cool, you can keep doing that. But there's always, there's going to be like the next Larry Wheels. Like, there just is, there have been, you know, over and over. So, like, if somebody does something, and, like, in the world of, in, in this day and age with social media, it allows people to put themselves out there, and this is a, both a blessing and a curse, right? Like, so, if we're all able to do that now, we can skip the middleman, and we can, like, tell our own stories, and we can commodify it, honestly, then, like, curate, you know, the products that are being pushed at you, a.k.a. the people that are pushing themselves at you as essentially products. You don't have to buy like what people are selling you. You can choose somebody else to go buy that, you know, isn't as troubling a figure. Of course, that does bring up the issue. Who isn't a troubling figure? You know, like Joe, you were saying, like, um, you know, human beings are, are rough, man. Like, you know, it's like, oh, this is such a great person. You know, we idolize this. And then you find out this thing and you're like, I don't know what to do with that crud. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's something that we're running into more and more frequently because of, you know, where we've evolved in terms of, like, technology and how human beings are communicating, which is, you know, social media right now. Um, but anyway. Well, it's, and that's just going off of what you just said. It's, it's a matter of people follow Larry, Larry Wheels, Larry Williams or whatever, because he puts up incredible feats of strength. And like I said on the whole thing when I was saying like not vetting the information, but valuing storytelling over um, just little blips of stimulation. So like a 15 second clip or the reality TV show for 30 minutes or the next episode of the bachelor or whatever, rather than taking those things in, it's, it's a matter of following storytelling or following along and actually building a relationship or, or feeling as if you're building a relationship with another individual. And then you get to have more of a, I don't want to say intimate connection with that other person, but you can, generally see more of them or more of that story or more strongly identify with an aspect of that story because Larry's always going to be a freak of nature you know um he's always going to be putting that stuff out until he isn't we all age we all break he tore his bicep he uh whatever you know he's not going to be in the sport forever and after that it's kind of like what's he going to do does he write does he teach does he advise does he do it well? I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know a whole lot about this because to be truthful about it, he has like zero influence on my life or company. So, I mean, if it's, if it's something that's completely out of my control, I really don't give a shit. Right. Um, but, you know, thou shalt not have false idols. I mean, this is kind of like, <laughs> you know, a major thing is when you idolize, you shouldn't really idolize people. You can respect with the things that they've done because it works two ways. You know, people may look at, you know, his, his lifts and his, you know, the videos that I've seen crazy ass lifts and say, well, you know, you can, you can respect that with, with all respect the hell out of that. You know, you know, it's like people are saying that he's got these great lifts, so he's a great person. So it's like you know nothing else about the person, but at the same time, that's really no different than saying, oh, you voted for Trump, so you're a piece of shit because of their political view. Now they're one huge piece of shit, you know, or their view on just one political, say, I don't want new roads being built. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to pay the school tax or whatever it is. So or, then or, all of a sudden yeah. I'm a complete total piece of shit because I don't want to pay more local tax dollars because it disagrees with somebody else. So disregard everything else about the person and only identify with them on this one issue um, where <laughs> that's where I think the social media allows people over a period of time. If you are following people, you can kind of get to see them a little bit more broad than when the narrative was completely controlled by 
uh, newspapers, magazines, and so forth, because they were never going to show the little cracks. Like every now and again on Instagram, somebody's going to crack and say some shit or mm-hmm. make some post, and then they're going to delete it and be like, oh, okay, but, you know, that's still that person. It's a piece of that person. But it's also a piece of that person that if they went back and took it down, that's a piece that should be recognized as well, mm-hmm. you know, because we're all human. Mm-hmm. You know, and humans make mistakes. We're, we're designed to make mistakes. You know, that's how you mm-hmm. get better is by learning from the mistakes that you make. But um, the one thing that I'd be interested in knowing, I'm sure it'd be easy to figure out, is do people, because I, when I was making the statement about the television, I completely forgot about talk shows and, you know, reality TV and even back even back then the news was basically controlled by corporations buying what stories they were going to push and mm-hmm. get talk to any anybody in public relations that's been around for 30 or 40 years, years and ask them how the stories got in the newspaper <laughs> you'll be surprised with that but i did forget about that so what i wonder is time wise how much cuz you could had to turn the tv on sit there i mean you had to make it like a physical commitment that I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch this and I'm going to get up there. I'm going to leave. And we know that people are on social far more than what the TV is, but by how much is probably astounding if we were to look at it, mm-hmm. which is either more pollution or, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's more pollution yeah. or more stimulation. Yeah, just yeah. depends on what you're yeah. looking at. Yeah. yeah. So it's, that's, that's the whole other, whole other part there. Cause it's, it's still, even if it's micro, you know, content, self-talk is a huge thing that I learned when I was wrestling. Just, you know, simple things that you say to yourself throughout the day. You catch yourself, oh, shit, I shouldn't say that. You say this. All right. Where if you're on social or all socials combined, whatever it is, you're on your phone, you know, all day long, you know, do you have any self-talk? Or is it just what you're reading? Because... You're processing that, you know, it's hard to process, you know, what you're consuming. If you're really thinking about it, you know, Mm -hmm. if I'm thinking about if I'm if you wrote something and I'm reading it or you posted something and I'm watching it, I'm really paying attention to it. There might be a little bit of my own thinking going on, but that really doesn't go on until after there's a pause or you stop. It's like, okay, let me process this. All right. Well, (laughs) how much? Self talk, you know, is it once again, it can be positive, it'd be negative, it's mm-hmm. you know, based upon the person. But it at some point in time, I think that there's not enough time with athletes, people that people that I that I know, you know, most don't take enough time to just be alone, you know, with their own thoughts mm-hmm. because it freaks them out. You know, it's mm-hmm. sometimes people don't like to deal with their their own thoughts. So it's easier to deal with the thoughts of others than to mm-hmm. deal with their own, which I think is taking five steps backwards to making no steps forward, mm-hmm. <laughs> essentially is where that comes. It's sort of why, why do you think so many people, there are so many, everybody loves to share like those self-help infographics mm-hmm. uh, where it's like, be mindful today, take a moment, blah, blah, blah. You know, like it, it's just like, the stuff where it's like, hey, practice meditation, be mindful. Like, uh, I, there's a lot of accounts that I follow because I, I enjoy them. But how many of the people that read those things where it's like, hey, take 30 minutes and just sit with nothing going on in a dark room and just, just focus on your breathing. How many people actually do that? I would say le- less than 1%. Because be, it, it's so difficult to do so these days i work on my phone like i i what just justin said the other day resonated with me incredibly where he picked up his phone and he's like well since starting this i have 23 text messages and like 15 emails and by the time we're done with that that will double that i i deal with that too it's very hard to get away it takes a certain level of self self self-discipline and that mindfulness because it's always there but you also you also have to realize that you are always there also and you have to be okay with just being with you and like i i make it a point every day like we talked about this a while back um just uh going into the 90 90 position with my feet up on something 
and just focusing on my breathing and being there. Some days I'll do that for two minutes. Mm -hmm. Some days I'll do it for the longest I've done it is 40, you know, and it, both of those lengths of time felt exactly the same. That's because it, you're stopping. You yeah. Know what I'm saying? And, and you're controlling the information that you're taking in. You're not, you're choosing in that moment not to deal with, uh, the, thoughts of others and just dealing with and trying to control your own thoughts and that's a fucking hard thing to do a lot of the time i i deal with a, a crazy amount of anxiety sometimes i know janice does too and it to actually have the ability and i don't want to say discipline because it's not a level of discipline it's a liter it's a skill that you need to develop but being able to do that is so beneficial sometimes. It, 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 it helps because if you, if you can conquer that aspect, when you come in here and, like, you're having a hard time focusing, like, what, what's that you told me uh, months ago, maybe even years ago now, where it's like, if you can't focus, like, how long does a set take? Ten seconds? Mm -hmm. Heavy single takes ten seconds. If you can't shut up, and get out of your own head, put everything else out of it besides you in that moment and you with that weight. If you can't do that for 10 seconds, you shouldn't be here in general. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it is the least demand. It is one of the least demanding things you could ever face in your life. And if you can't conquer that, you need to reevaluate where you're at and work on some other things before you even try to do anything like that. Or you get hurt. Yeah, exactly. So one of the missing keys, I think, that that people, you know, as they try to navigate, they're taking in all of this information. You know, Dave, as you said, like they're just taking in so much. You know, they're they're scrolling through things, taking in, taking in. Things resonate with them. They see these stupid like infographic, like I know what you're talking about, like where they repost some meme or whatever. And they're like, and so it's not their words. They're just reposting it. They're doing this. They're doing this. They're taking stuff in, and then they're regurgitating things that already exist. Um, the key thing that I think, if we're going to survive some of the more negative aspects of this so-called information overload. Um, what I think a lot of people haven't really pushed themselves to do yet, and it's, it's not even, it's not meditating, it's not stopping, is actually taking that information, like taking time and creating like your own, you know, output back into the world because you're taking things in. And often it is the creation, like, you know, taking stuff in and then taking time to create something. I, here's the thing. I can't tell you what it's going to be. Like, it could, it could be anything. It could be the way that you post on social media. It could be writing an article. It could be, you know, some other. It has to be, it's like speaking, though. And there is a lot, there are many, many forms of self-expression. I think that actually is a key to, you know, collectively, as we navigate a faster and faster information overload, you know, situation that continues to occur with how, you know, we do social media, how things exchange of information is, is changing. That's going to be one of the keys that is people are going to sink or swim with psychologically. Um, because, you know, you have to force yourself to rest, sure, you know, shut everything off. Um, I need to just, like, make everything quiet. But when we talk about processing, you know, there's, like, a processing time. You'd be surprised at how the act of, like, creation, the act of actually standing up, because it's not, it's scary to do this. It is scary to, like, stand up and say something. Um, it's scary to put things out there. But studied, you know, acts of creation and, you know, people are like, I don't know what that means. What do I put out there? And I'm like, okay, a good place to start is if you do see something that you feel strongly about that resonates with you, the chances are that somebody else feels strongly about it too. So that's a jumping off point. Like if you encounter some piece of information somewhere, then, you know, and you respond strongly to it take a second and be like, all right, I'm going to freaking, I'm going to produce something about this. And so this is the, um, like I have an MFA, uh, Masters of Fine Arts. Um, and like, I, this is something, I always used to say it was such a waste of time to get this stupid thing, especially because now I'm off in like the strength world, whatever. Um, but this is actually something that's really, I'm seeing has a lot of value um, because it's helping me understand how to navigate, you know, my own psychology within, you know, focusing on, my lifting life, which is kind of my life, 
it just comes in and out of my other life. Like I have lifting and then I have my life, but lifting is never out of my life. Like I'm always coming back to it mentally. Um, how do I keep myself sane with that? And like, like with my lifting life and like my life that isn't lifting and then like social media, like onslaught crud, which I get some good things out of, but some bad things. How do I like, where is the point where I'm like taking control? And my argument is that you take control by you yourself stepping up and creating things. And both, you know, Dave and Joe, you both do this. And I think you know that. But I do want to point out that I, one of the reasons that you have such a strong presence online um, or wherever is, is because you're, you're doing what I'm talking about. So. And, that's, and that goes to, say, or go, goes to further what I was saying. Like, it's, it's being alone. It's shutting everything off. Like, yes, being mindful and and being in that moment with yourself but then what happens in that moment when you're alone with yourself you start thinking and you can identify those thoughts it's really difficult to do that sometimes but then once you identify those thoughts then you can actually be like okay why am i thinking that why do i feel that way why am i bringing this to my mind in this current moment and then to go on and further it is is through the production of anything some type of creative content and that's uh that's a really like you said that's a really good thing that people can do and that's really how people that's how people reach that like i don't want to say elevated status but it's just sort of they they reach that status where people look up to them and believe me i'm like you said it's it's scary to do I, I've, I've told you this before. I've told you this when uh, I was first brought on as an athlete. Like, I'm terrified every time I write anything because that's, like, put me in front of people, tell me to speak in front of people, tell me to lift in front of whomever, like cameras flashing, whatever. Fuck it. I don't care. I'll do that. I, I could do that naked, and I wouldn't be embarrassed. to be like, fuck, whatever. But to actually write and put my thoughts on paper or electronically or whatever and put that out, that is such a higher level of, again, intimacy. Like, it's it's more open. It's more open for analysis, and it's a constant thing. So that it's much scarier for me to do that. And that's, like, anyone who tries to come up with some type of individual content or something some type of uh, expression of their thoughts, whether it's writing, singing, music, drawing, whatever, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard and it's scary because it is purely you doing it. And, and to allow other people to see that is an overwhelming thing sometimes. So that's, it, it's hard for people to develop that skill, but it's an incredibly valuable skill to have. I think it's still valuable even if they don't post it. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I strongly believe people should write every day, you know, regardless of what their means of doing it is. If it's just writing in a notebook or you know, tapping on a notepad on a phone or, you know, just writing your thoughts every day, I guess you call it journaling or storytelling, just whatever you want to do, write every day because even if you're writing a story and you're putting it down a lot of that story is still going to be you mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying for most people unless they're creative writers that know how to actually write in different voices and and so forth they're still going to be putting it out which is getting that stuff out there it's just where i have confusion a lot of the times is i've always been very good at being able to separate what I can control and what I can't control and what I can't control. I seriously don't, I'm indifferent to it to such a high degree that it really doesn't matter, you know, until it crosses the line and becomes something that now I have to control or I have to deal with or to work with. It's just pollution, you know, and it, it destroys creativity, but I have to be more, this may be a bad way to state this, I have to be more protective of that creativity because I run a business and I have other people that I'm responsible for. So I can't allow people to steal time away from the creative aspects that I need to develop 
and work on the business because they're not worth that. If I don't know who they are, they, they're, I don't know them. You know, I, I don't know who the fuck they are. They, they have zero influence, you know, whatsoever. Now, if it is, you know, a customer or somebody that I do know, then that's a different story. But I think from what I <laughs> see a lot of is, you know, people get caught up in, say, drama or whatever it is. It really, sometimes it's fun. You know, sometimes it's just, let's say, gossip. And let's define there's a difference between gossip and drama right gossip is something that you just like to talk about it's really not going to impact your life drama is something that it might you know it might be like this little hurricane that's going to whack you in the face or a branch from it's going to whack you in the face and you don't even know it's coming um i mean you should be cognitive of that but i think for what i see And I'm trying to think of the, the bigger gatherings where there's more people, like seminars and stuff like that. You know, all the discussions drift towards really stupid and significant shit. It's like, you know, guys, you're, you're with a group of people who are pretty damn close to the same level that you're at in this, let's just say, the sport of powerlifting. You know, and you're talking about... Larry Wheels. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So or, it's, or who's fucking who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, this is so fucked up because while in the sport, you know, there's, Jana spoke a little bit about the genetic potential. Everybody likes to talk about genetics and they definitely p play a role. But there's thousands upon thousands of people that have amazing genetics to be the greatest power lifters ever. I mean, of all time. And, um, they never even get exposed to the sport. Mm -hmm. So they end up doing something else. But regardless of that, the where people want to look, it's, they all want to look to see like what you're doing and what I made in the last Instagram, two Instagram posts because they missed it the first time is don't look so much at the lift. Look at what's being done before the lift mm -hmm. because with all, not all, but with so much training being online training, and it's just the programming, people are training alone more so than they've ever done before. Mm -hmm. Where when you're training in a gym, regardless if you're using the same program or the same technique, you're still watching what you do. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you do between sets? All right, well, when the shit gets heavier, the chair is a little bit closer. You know, there's less, you know, as it gets heavier, the dialogue still continues amongst other people, but it becomes less. It becomes, you know, more focused. And, mm -hmm. you know, then after the big lift's over, you know, joking around, having fun, still getting the work done. Mm -hmm. But the whole, that's the, that, that's the stuff that people don't see because they don't train in groups you know, anymore. Mm -hmm. So they don't see even how people, how they trim stuff now. So you don't even see a walkout. So they just see, you know, a pick squat rack. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh shit, you know, this was a third of actually the entire, what I would call the lift, mm -hmm. you know, from the time you decide it's time to go. Mm -hmm. All right. That might be a three minute process. Mm -hmm. um, then there's all the time before that you know, which is a whole nother story, but they're not even seeing that. So then what they see is, you know, your aggressive state from the time you, you double wrap. So mm -hmm. by the time you crank down the second wrap and that's done, then boom, you're in that mm -hmm. state. So that's all they see on the normal video, mm -hmm. crazy Joe, then it lifts the weight. Then they go in the gym and it's like crazy John, yeah. you know, on trying every fucking it. set, yeah. trying to emulate it where mm -hmm. I think with, with so many people on social media, like John, the average class three lifter, needs to find like a class two lifter or a class one lifter mm -hmm. and befriend them, you mm -hmm. know, follow them. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of really fucking cool people that are working their way up the ranks that care about the sport. Mm -hmm. Follow them, ask them questions. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask somebody who's been a top lifter, for five years, a decade, or whatever it is, you've already overcome the things that a novice is going to have to overcome mm -hmm. 10 years ago, 
15 years or more, you know what I'm saying? Eight years yeah, ago, 10 yeah, years ago, yeah. you know, a long time ago. And you, you, you coach, so you know how to help them overcome it because you're doing it with other novices. Mm -hmm. But for that novice to befriend somebody that's just a couple notches higher, like 300 pounds higher on their total, mm -hmm. they, they send them a question. First off, they're going to get an answer because the person's going to be like, oh, my God. Yeah, somebody like, oh, fucking you're says asking so, you're asking yeah. me yeah you know I, I my squat's not that good it's only ranked like 60 or 70 mm -hmm. but this dude who's asking it's ranked like 390 mm -hmm. and this guy could ask a question and then the other person say you know what i had that exact same problem last year and then go out of their way to help them because they're they're flattered you know mm -hmm. for one thing and and in strength sports, helping other people reinforces what you know, and they're not going to get blown off, you know, because mm -hmm. what I find is very frustrating, the number of people who I'll answer a DM from that I'm the only person that they've ever got an answer from. Mm -hmm. Very frustrating. It's like, you know, there's, there's people who represent the sport that you can answer a fucking, if I can answer a DM with all the other shit I have to do you can answer a DM, even if you have to copy and paste yeah. a statement that says, look, I'm really busy. I apologize. Here's some of the websites that I go to when mm -hmm. I have questions mm -hmm. and then put elite FTS.com obviously. Or, or yeah. And yeah, then yeah. you see it, what I'm or, saying? Yeah. I, I understand. Cause we've, we've talked about this before where like if somebody, cause I had, I had this happen the other day. You, well, not the other day, but a couple of weeks ago, you posted one, one of your Instagram posts, it was something about like passing it on or uh, you and J JM were talking about uh, what you lift isn't what people are going to remember you by. Mm -hmm. It's it's who you are and what you do or how people are going to remember you. And somebody commented on there and tagged me in the comments uh, and was like, well, Joe, I, I messaged him. And after like two other people, t like tr either trying to sell me a program or saying like, I, I can't help you, I, I get paid for that. I'm the only one that went back or I'm the only one that answered and said, like, I, I laid it out for him. Mm -hmm. And that one, that made me feel good. But two, I went back and I looked and all he asked me was like, hey, I just finished such and such program. I'm like five weeks out from my meet. I signed up for this on a whim. I really don't know what to do. And I'm and I it, it took the entire exchange took me three minutes because I responded to him and I'm like, well, what do you do? And he's like, well, I did this last week and I did this the, la the week before. And I'm like, okay, hit your opener today or hit your openers this week. Do some back down volume after, do whatever on accessories. The next week, hit like between your opener and what you want your second attempt to be and do some less back down volume and then just do some triples the week after and then deload that week and then go compete. And he's like, okay, cool. And then he responded a week later, and he's like, dude, that was awesome meet. I love it. It was great. I love powerlifting. Got bit by the iron bug, whatever. And it took me like th two, three minutes. And I just, I, I get blown away when I hear people say like, oh, I, well, or, or when people come to me, like you said, and they're like, oh, well, you're the only one that answered me. You're the only one that really cared because that it's in a world where online coaching and online training is so... Um, so popular or so populated by individuals i just wonder like what the fuck are these people doing if if somebody can't if if you can't take the time to answer just another dude that comes and asks you something you know even if they're not paying you just give them a moment give them well, a moment of your day and i i know i know that it it's it's from i i know both arguments and I, I, there comes a time where like people will try, like try to, you give them an inch, they try to take a mile. But at the same time, like what is, what was that for me? And what was that for him? It was, it was a positive interaction. And it could be argued that it's like practice for me. Cause if I have somebody come up to me, if, if somebody comes in the gym and like each, each weekend we've been having like more and more people come in here. And if they ask me a question, it's just practice. You know, just speaking with another individual, if someone looks to you as a coach or looks to Janice as a role model or me as a coach or whatever, and they come up and ask me, it's just allowing me to be like, okay, well, I can put it this way for this person. Might not resonate with that person, but I can put it this way. Okay, and if they don't get that, maybe I could put it this way. And it's just developing speaking skills. Well, it's, it's also by them not answering, it's, it's poor business, mm -hmm. right? So 
regardless if I had a business or not, I would still answer, you know, my DMs. I may not answer all of them like mm -hmm. I do now. I may do more copy and paste, you know, of go to these different websites mm -hmm. um, where it would be more website specific. My copy and paste now are basically article specific, you know, be able to go here and it's, that's a whole nother conversation when I'll talk about when you can, cause you said, you know, people can be draining, you know, if I send somebody an, an article, which answers their question in full detail. And I know it takes no longer than three minutes and they already hit me with five more questions before that article's over, mm -hmm. they're done. And I'm going to tell them, you know, look, obviously I'm not the person to help you. You know, you should try to find somebody else. You know, if you want to read the article, then hit me up with any questions you have about it. I'll be more than willing to answer, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to deal with this you know, other stuff, but where it becomes bad business is <clears throat> who's going to be more likely to do business with elite FTS, somebody that read a post that I made that was like, wow, that was a cool post or somebody that I actually DM'd with. That's the a very, DM, very yeah. simple concept because one went from being a reader slash follower to the other one being a relationship, a, a mm -hmm. very small relationship but a relationship with two entities communicating mm -hmm. so you have more likelihood of actually doing business when you're in a relationship with somebody as compared to doing business with somebody that you're not the other thing with uh, post is when you're in business and this is what cracks me up with uh, people trying to build the online training they all want to make the best post or the the post that's going to create conflict or have the most comments or whatever it is. You can make a post that 500, 200, whatever it is, people are like, yeah, that was the greatest post of all time. But if it's a post that's on the edge in any way whatsoever, there's also 200 to 300 people who will never hire you ever mm -hmm. based upon what you just said. Mm -hmm. So there's zero likelihood of you're going to lose a customer from a, a dm mm -hmm. unless you're a complete dick but even if you're a complete dick but you're honest about why you're being a complete dick you're still going to be building trust and honesty which mm -hmm. has the likelihood of actually building a customer compared to making a post or making a statement mm -hmm. which can, it's, it's i call it the uh years ago before so actually social media kind of made a little bit it's like the sponsorship paradox it's like we used to run campaigns to bring sponsors in and we would bring in say 20 sponsors and maybe sponsor five of them well we knew whoever those five were had to have more they had to have as much or more impact than the negativity of those 15 that didn't get it are going to create Mm -hmm. because they're going to be pissed and they're never going to buy from us because they knew that they were on the radar mm -hmm. and then they didn't make the cut, even though they should be honored that they were on the radar. Mm -hmm. But because they didn't make the cut, there's a gym that we're not going to outfit. There's a referral we're never going to get. So you, whoever those five are, aren't just, you see what I'm saying? It's like mm -hmm. covering your own ass because there's pros and cons from the business perspective. And most of these people that we're talking about now, the only reason they're on Instagram is to get online clients. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they would not be posting and they wouldn't be doing anything. You know, they're, they're, it's very simple to see, just look when they joined and look when they started pimping their services. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take very long, or you can look when they joined them, look when online training started to become popular and you can see there. The other thing from a business perspective, to the potential customer is if they're blowing you off and they're not answering their DMs, they're telling you they don't care. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's that simple, you know, cause it's granted if you have 2000 DMs every single day, I can see that being a problem, but you know, the odds are that's not the case. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's really not. So you don't want to hire somebody that doesn't care. So if you keep trying to DM these people because of their perceived status in the industry, which I say perceived because it's usually nowhere close in real life to what it is, to what they've created it to be, you know, <laughs> with marketing strategies and so forth on Instagram, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it, that's what I'm saying. It's not that hard to find a good coach. 
you know, start DMing some people and all the ones that don't DM you back, they're gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, then you're not left with that. Then you start vetting out from there. It's really not that hard. That's, I mean, I, this is actually a topic um, that I've been thinking about a lot in the last few weeks. Um, by that, this topic, I mean online coaching. Um, and I've wondered, and I don't have any way of knowing this, but I've wondered what this is doing to athletic development in terms specifically of powerlifting. I mean, I mean, it could be other. I just can speak to this. You know, I have some experience with it. But I am starting to wonder what people's um, athletic history, life trajectories look like partially because you know online remote coaching in i'm thinking is becoming more in the whole history of powerlifting you know it is now a thing it was mm. not a thing like 20 years ago no. so what i feel like this is this very nuanced like complicated question but what is this doing to people's athletic like lifelines like you know lives um physical you know trajectory to be because because here Here's my point with this is that, you know, you get people who are going into business as online coaches and how do they get business? I mean, there's multiple ways, but one of those things is going to be showing results, mm -hmm. right? And if we have a sport in which athletic development time is long as hell, like, to, you know, I mean, it's like a long term physical development towards, you know, your really, really good levels of maximal strength. Like, but, you know, the coach needs his like results now they need to show results now then what you're getting is i'm just i have like a theory on this i don't know if this is right but what i feel like is happening at least in some cases is you get coaches who are doing these like high volume crazy i mean i feel like I'm right on this very confidently really crazy you know like you know, you're just going to like pummel people with volume. They go into a meet, they got like an X number of pound increase on their total. Look at this. Yay for X client. I can use them as advertising. And you get coaches who, you know, then they bring in another mediocre lift or like, like intermediate level. S slightly better than average. Yeah. Like inter and they just do yeah. this and they take mm -hmm. another one and they do this. And then, you know, and then that person goes off somewhere else because of like X, Y, they might've gotten an injury, X, Y, Z, other thing. Like this tells me this makes me kind of think that if you take somebody in their athletic career it, it looks different than it might have if we didn't have people turning to like online coaching quite as much if you know if their coaching was getting was happening from elsewhere because is like the way that people are you know, making their living as coaching actually impacting how they choose to run their athletes careers i I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm going to take a, a side here that people wouldn't expect. Maybe this person never would have done a meet in the first place if it wasn't for the coach. Mm -hmm. So there would be no trajectory because they wouldn't have done it. And then that you saying that you can think like how, how much has this sport grown in the but past there's, there four is, years? Yeah. What we do know is there's a big hole in the bucket. So people yeah. come in, come out, come yeah. in, come out, yeah. come in, come out. Yeah. And that, that has to deal with that. I know from, just from the, as an outsider looking into the whole thing, you know, I'm definitely, I've been vocal about this. I am not a fan about it. You know, I think you need to be very, very, very good to even have marginal success as an online coach. Um, and the higher they get, you're going to have to see the people in person at some point in time, even if it's just one session a month to be able, you're just going to have to. Um, now for a beginner and intermediate, you can pretty much do anything, but you'd be surprised at how many beginners and intermediates can fuck stuff up where powerlifting USA used to have the workout of the month. You could follow that. And that pretty much was the online coach that most people are getting today from that standpoint. But what's happened is the the scenarios that you're speaking about have devalued the how much a real coach can actually he can't charge what he's actually worth mm -hmm. you know justin can't charge what he's actually worth yeah. you know you just he can't, he can't if you just took your personal training rate that you used to charge and then you applied that to how much time you spend with each client I'd, individually i'd retire in two years exactly i mean you're 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 making pennies on the dollar compared to what you would make with regular personal training and um but that's because 
the market's so saturated, all right, and the customers are not educated enough to be able to know, yes, this should cost $1,000 for 12 weeks or $1,200 for 12 weeks. Everybody charges $250 or whatever it is, you know, for the 12 weeks. So that's what everybody jumps in at. And where that leaves me to believe that the truly best at the online coaches are going to be sending out the most generalized program they can for anybody that they know is a beginner and is going to be able to make progress on whatever they do. So the beginner is actually getting not a whole lot of help, but they're still going to make progress because they're going to progress no matter what they do. And then that saves the time for them to focus on the ones that they really have to help navigate, um, treading or, or strong currents, you know, because it's not easy as an intermediate or an advanced. There's times it's not easy and it takes a lot of coaching to be able to help get them through that strong current to get it back to where you can kind of back off a little bit. But there has to be I can kind of let Joe speak a little bit on this because he's managing, you know, a number of clients, but not every client's going to get the same amount of attention, nor does that happen in any profession. But what happens with the, um, the people that you're talking about that really don't know how to navigate the waters is they just throw the basic shit at everybody and devalues everything where he should, I mean, the price actually should escalate based upon the complexity of how long it's going to be. Because an advanced lifter, you know, I know if I was to ever do this for a living, which I would hopefully never have to do. I wouldn't want to sign anybody unless I had a six meet commitment and there'd be a big ass fucking retainer paid. And cause it's going to be worked backwards on a template standpoint for something damn near quadrennial, or I am not going to waste my time because all I'm going to do is train somebody to peak and then they're going to fucking disappear because they don't want to pay for the coaching in the off season, which is where you really get strong anyhow. And that's where they need the most help. That's when they need pulled back the most so they don't get hurt, yep. you know. And um, so all they're doing is it's the same thing that's happened in, in bodybuilding since, God, since people were doing it with telephone and Polaroids. They're just peaking people for shows. And then when they really need to grow, they add the new muscle. They don't pay for anything. You know, they don't do it. So they come back the next year with no increase in lean body mass mm -hmm. so these people will train have somebody help peak them for a meet and then wait till tw 12 weeks out for the next meet say okay i got another meet and you're like okay where are you at and you're like oh my god you know you're actually you can't tell them but you're 10 percent weaker than you were last time yep all right so well that it if if i were to, if i were to charge like based on uh time commitment or like time, like how much time I spent with each individual client. I have, I have clients like Houston has been here. Wyatt has been here. These guys, uh, Dexter, Tyree, those guys, I, I can just say like, do this. And they're like, Hey Joe, I'm thinking about doing this. Don't do that. That's fucking stupid. They're it. They're already at the, the super advanced to elite level. They don't need a lot of help. They've been training for forever. We've been working together for forever. They know what to do. It's just me telling them what not to do. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. That's fucking dumb. Like, why would you even say that? But the other people who are that the, the average to intermediate to like have a 1500, 1600 total and could definitely make it to an elite total but they don't really know they've been training for like three or four years don't really know where to go those are the people that i spend a considerable amount of time with because and 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 they're, and they're the ones that i want to drive out here just so i can see them lift like i'm not i don't treat it as a personal training session and i've had i actually had a person get upset with me a couple of weeks ago because i i invited them out and they trained and they were like well i thought we were going to work together and i'm like fuck no i have my own stuff to do and if you if you wanted a personal training session that's 150 dollars an hour and every minute after that you're getting charged more because i like i i will work with you but that i i don't want to just the reason i don't do an incredible amount of person of in-person personal training or i don't have regular clients i see every week because i hate the whole like okay we're gonna take you through we're gonna take you through the warm-up we're going to take you through the workout, going to have short rest times, you're going to sweat, 
it's going to be good. We're going to do a little circuit. Then you're going to do a cool down. And it'll be great. That doesn't do shit. You know, that do and that doesn't do anything for anyone who wants to be strong. Like, off-season protocol, cool. You can go in and fuck around and do stuff like that. But... When you're actually trying to get strong, that's it's it's not going to get you anything. And then how many I've I've had like I've I've bitched to both of you about this. I've had people that have been with me for like 12 or 16 weeks. They'll come to me and they're like, "Hey, I, I I'm here. I've been doing this because I ask for a training and health history every time I take somebody on, and I see what they're doing. And I'm like, okay, we can set you up for success." And but I'm very clear with everybody. I I want a lo a longer term commitment because it that's how you actually make the most the most progress the most gains. But then how often how often I will and I know there are people that listen to this podcast that have done this to me, where they they will, will I they'll hire me. I'll peek them into a meet for 12 or 16 weeks. They'll hit a PR total. They'll go eight for nine, nine for nine, seven for nine, whatever, and just smoke all their previous bests. And I'm fired the fuck up about like, let, we're going to go into the next year. It's going to be even more than that. We're going to just start hammering shit. This is going to be great. And then they go to somebody else because they're cheaper, because they have an idea of what to do now, or they're just going to do their own thing for a minute. How frustrating is that? Because that it it sort of it, it devalues what I do. And like you said, I couldn't. There would be no possible way for me to charge what would actually be necessary to charge for like a thousand dollars for twelve weeks, because no one would pay it. Because I know that there are individuals out there that charge a hundred and a hundred dollars a month, two hundred dollars for twelve weeks, guys that charge pennies on the dollar because they don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't give a fuck. It's just an extra thing. It's, it's their thing so that they can pay for the extra uh, fucking Anadrol going into the meat. It's their thing so they can pay for their flight getting to the meat. The special on coaching, hit me up because mm -hmm. look at their training protocol. They're four months out from their next meet. They want to pay for their cycle. They want to pay for their flights. They yeah. want to pay for whatever the fuck, you know? And it's, it's frustrating, but... I don't know. It's one of those things. It's, it's, uh, I don't want to go back to the cliche of like the, the cream will rise to the top, but it kind of tends to happen after a while because like the same thing with social media and people putting their uh, personas out there, you can't really fake it all the time and people start to pay attention, but I don't know. Well, it's, I mean, it's with the, the main marketing means for online coaching being Instagram, but it's really not. The main marketing means are referrals. You know, everybody mm -hmm. skips that big thing. Most of your clients are coming from the clients that you currently have. Mm -hmm. But it's it's hard for many people to keep up the post. Mm -hmm. You know, you would think, oh yeah, Instagram is just posting shit. But no, it's not. You know, you have to I'm not saying you have to be an an expert at Instagram, but you have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't post like for a few weeks and then not post for five weeks and mm -hmm. then expect that you're going to build a clientele. You know, it's, you know, if you're building a business, if it's not online, just any business whatsoever, and you're using social media, you have to have some degree of consistency or just don't do it because they're, they're going to see through it. You know, don't, don't commit to something that you can't, follow through and then because they'll, they'll start out you'll see great posts maybe mm -hmm. infographics and long micro blogs and all this other kind of stuff then you start seeing pictures of frogs dogs and cats and just shit like that and that's all it is and because they realize fuck this takes time mm -hmm. you know it takes 15 20 minutes to actually put this you know, for them maybe an hour and a half mm -hmm. you know to be able to put a thought out you know and from that standpoint it does, the cream does rise to the top, but the problem is there's two the the bucket's got so many holes so in it that big, it, yeah. you know if, if if the bucket the spore would continue to keep growing instead of just staying where it is and you know people coming and going all within a year this problem so to say would kind of resolve itself as all business does to where the best businesses will separate themselves based upon brand identity and whatnot. But when more than half of the sport, I bet, are all brand new, mm -hmm. then 
the, the person who's going to monetize the most is going to be the one that's going to figure out how to take advantage of the newest people coming in mm -hmm. and how to train the most in one time, mm -hmm. you know, and how to sell the most programs at one time mm -hmm. and be able to have launches of three, 400 programs because they don't give a fuck about the second program mm -hmm. because there won't be one. Exactly. You know, so that's where your morals, your values, you know, your business philosophy, that's where it all kind of comes into play on what, what game you want to play and who you want to compete with. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to compete on the longevity of creating the best lifter or getting the best, you know, the most out of the lifter that you're working with, you can't play that game over here. Mm -hmm. If you try, you're going to, your, your quality and service is going to go down mm -hmm. and it's going to suffer. You know, at the same time, it's frustrating because you'll see these guys over here making 10 times as much. Right. But, you know, they are trends and fads. So over mm -hmm. a long period, it's not really 10 times as much because you'll be around 10 times as long. Mm -hmm. So just thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I think there'd be good ones to be putting out there for the consumer, you know, you know, talking, you know, okay, what does it really look like to be a, an effective coach? And when I say effective, I mean, you're making stronger people and how long does that take? That takes a while. So what we're doing right now is we're talking about that and we're giving people a little bit more, hopefully of a blueprint, to like, okay, I'm going to select somebody to work with, or this is what I'm going to do with my coaching for this sport that I'm involved in right now. And hopefully for a long time, what is it like, what do I really have to look for? And it's not, I mean, it's harder to judge that than I think everybody thinks. And I think there needs to be discussion because this is like a relatively new, as I said earlier, this is like a relatively new way that people are, you know, um, doing things. Um, you know, the, running their own training, you know, uh, the sport is going, I mean, it, it's growing. The sport is growing as we say, but like what I don't like is the, the retention, right? The bucket situation. And, you know, I have a lot of people who follow me and a lot of people who I say are like intermediate lifters because that's, that's like the bulk mm -hmm. of what people are going to be. And, you know, those people, I, you know, what I want to do is help them. Honestly, I'm not a coach. But, you know, I put my training out there um, and and I it really it makes me happy to help people. So when people reach out to me and, you know, they ask questions like how to get better, I'm not satisfied with this thing. What I keep coming back to at this point is that everybody, including by my, myself, by the way, and like I think more than I think everybody needs to basically take however they're thinking about you know, their involvement in strength sports and add like three years onto it. Like the, the way that we are thinking about this in terms of time is everybody. I mean, even coaches, but definitely coaches who are looking to make a buck, a lot of bucks versus a buck. There's, there's a difference. Like everybody needs to do, to like back up and be like, I need to think about myself as a body and the body has limits and it's fun to go and get PRs and meets like, and I know that's what's going to keep people doing this. But the problem is, is your body only has so much of that to give. Okay. It puts miles on your body. Um, eventually, you know, we all know if we all just go and do a meet every other month, which some people try to do, most of us are going to hit a wall. And, but, you know, so it's like, how do I stay doing this? How do, how do we get people to stay doing this when sometimes they're, you know, they're running into walls, you know, even just doing it normally, even not doing a meet every other month. Um, and I think that's where actually, you know, social media is showing, allowing people who have been doing this for a while, you know, for more than five years, for example, um, but, you know, definitely 10 years or more like it allowing people to be like, if, if you're willing to do it, to be like, this is what's not easy about my involvement in this. This is what hasn't been easy about, you know, doing this. This is where the slowdowns have been. This is, you know, where I'm struggling, but I'm, I'm still here. And this is how I've stayed here. And this is how you can stay here too. I'm showing you, I'm going to put myself out there. Um, you know, coaches, how do you talk to your clients so that they can deal with like the slowdowns? They can deal with the slow trajectory that actually like you cannot deny that actually is the sport. I don't care how you speed it up. And by the way, any way that you speed it up, you're going to pay for it. Like it, your, your, your body, the body always wins. So you're going to pay for however you speed this up or try to, um, and you're not going to be able to after a certain point. So like, how do we get our minds to sync up with the fact that our bodies 
are like only going to go so hard for so long, only going to PR so much and how development is going to slow way the heck down. Like what, you know, what can coaches do? What can a relationship with coaches do to keep people? I mean, I'm speaking for the consumer. I'm not speaking for the person trying to make a buck. I yeah, got to yeah. say, I think that's up to the coach and the, the, if we're, if we're sticking with the online coaches, if they could just put themselves in the positions of offline coaches, so high school strength coaches, college strength coaches, they're dealing with, you know, some genetic to actually they're all dealing with genetic outliers to a degree. I mean, some of them are dealing with, you know, the mutts that just kind of fall into the sport that are there, but usually not at the college level. But they all have very limited training years experience so i think if the online coach was to actually ask that new client how long have you been training first off they're going to get a very exaggerated number they're going to get a number of well you know i remember doing some stuff in junior high for wrestling so yeah like when i was a teenager you know and then from that standpoint because the wear and tear that you're talking about Yes, that's going to happen during the main list, but it happens during every accessory exercise as well. How many online coaches are asking for videos of every accessory exercises that these guys are doing? Now, if you walk into even a Division I football program where there is one coach or intern per every six athletes and just watch their bench technique and squat technique, as powerlifters, most of us are going to fucking cringe all right, and they're under a watchful eye of people who are certified professionals at what they do. So I'm not going to sit there and say that they suck as coaches. They're dealing with people who have very, very limited training experience and very limited experience moving their body in tight positions throughout space. As an athlete, a football player, you don't jump for a pass in a tight, braced position. They're conditioned to play loose and move. So now you're putting them in an environment and saying everything that you've done your entire life to be great, we have to do backwards. All right. And um, so I think the same things are there. It's just what I think gets overlooked are the accessories because that's going to, for some programs, if it's, you know, if it's a conjugate pro program, that's, that's 80% of all the work being done. That's never being looked at. So for a beginner, you know, I could make the argument that that might not be how you want to train if you're going to go an online route. You might want to go something that's more 100% specific just based upon the main lifts and the, um, a couple accessories and then just do the same shit over and over and over and over until it's done correctly and then branch off from there. But if the coach isn't even intelligent enough to understand the discussion, that we're having, and this is a very simplified, easy to understand discussion, but I personally know people that are doing online coaching that wouldn't have a fucking clue what I just said. All right. They shouldn't be, but that falls back on client education again, you know, so that's up to the people who are in the industry to be able to help provide that client education free from ads, yeah. you know, so if you're an online coach, you know, help other people decide who to pick as an online coach, because I'll tell you what, it, you may not jive with a certain person, but that doesn't mean that that person's not a good coach. Mm -hmm. Now, if that coach you don't jive with says, you know what, I don't think this is really working out just personality wise, then refers you to somebody else that really works out. Guess where your referrals are going to go. They're not going to go to the coach that you're currently working with. They're always going to go back to the first one because they put your best interests first. Mm -hmm. That this is personal training one-on-one. You know, so it, it falls back on the coaches, you know, instead of branding themselves, branding the actual service, you know, and how they're all afraid to tell people how to pick a coach because they don't want to look biased, you know, mm -hmm. and too cocky, or they really don't want them to know because they don't want to get exposed, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, we have articles that are on the site that you can just type and search and it will give you my biased view, you know, on what to look for, but everybody's view, you know, is definitely going to be biased. I can say if you're, if, if, a, if a coach isn't willing to give, and this is kind of throwing a lot of people under the bus, but fuck them. If a coach isn't willing to give some type of money back guarantee, fuck them. Don't hire them. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Are you going to get fucked? Everybody thinks they're going to get fucked. 
oh, if I do that and I'm a coach, everybody is going to want their money back at the end. No, not if you did a good job. If you did a really good job, they're going to try to find a way to thank you. You know, they'll buy you a T-shirt. They'll do something to be able to thank you. They're not going to do that. Will you get fucked every now and again? Maybe. But you know what? When you decided to, to work as an online coach, is the same day you decided to have your own business. So mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that you can be an online coach but not have to deal with business problems. Mm-hmm. You know, customer service is a business problem. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it comes with the territory. You can't have – it's like they want to have the best of it, you know, and, or, you know, bring all this money in, semi-cash, do this, but not pay taxes on any of it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, taxes are part of a business too. Mm-hmm. So you're going to have to put some money back. Oh, because you work for yourself. <laughs> you should probably put 50% back instead of mm-hmm. – because it's not going to be what it typically is, you know, when you're an employer because, you know, it's uh, – Anyhow, I don't want to go on a big rant about that, but there's all those other things, you know, that go along Mm -hmm. with having a business, but they don't want to do that. They just want money for tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. Like, uh, I, I had this discussion with a friend of mine literally yesterday, like about, uh, I have how, how often, again, speaking about like clients that you have coached or I have coached, there are there have been more than one occasion where I will coach somebody and I will invest a lot of time in this individual and they have been in the sport for like two or three years. And then they go on and they're like, Hey, I'm going to go do my own thing right now. And then I see two or three weeks after that spots open for coaching. Uh, they're taking clients and I'm like, K not opposed to that but kind of makes me wonder. And then I just always refer back to the article or the blog or whatever it is that you put up where it's like how to rank your online coach. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I, I, I want to share that every day for the rest Mm -hmm. of my life. And that makes me look biased, like you said, because it's, Oh, well, they should have an education. They should have experience. They should have, uh, hours working in person with individuals. They should have, uh, hours spent under the bar just basically not just education, not just experience, but a combination of both and a willingness to be open to more of any of those things. And that's like, oh, well, you're, you just want to share that because that like backs up what you are. And I'm like, well, maybe that's why I have people that I've worked with for like three or four years that have gone from 1,000 pound totals to 1,900 pound totals. Maybe that's why I have a guy that broke an all-time world record. I have a guy that was a... a IPL world champion. I have, I have results and I just, no one, no one really like people love to share the things that you put out there that I put out there. They love to share the blurbs, just the, it's just like share to my story, share to my story because it's the same thing with those mindful infographics or whatever. It's not their own individual thoughts and it's validation that they can get because they'll share this and be like, these are my thoughts. I identify with this and I agree with this, but how often do those same people that have a propensity to share those things, how often would they share it? If, if you put out, these are what you need out of an online coach. These are what you need out of a training partner. These are what you need out of whatever, because it's calling some of those individuals out because they know in their heart of hearts that they don't fulfill those needs. Well, that, that's, a, that's a good thing because it brings up going back to posting on the social media stuff. First, the, the, the ranking thing that I put together, if you look really close, if you've never power lifted before, you're still a good coach. Mm-hmm. All right. So the only place that's fucked up, and it was Mike Tushinger who pointed this out to me, is nowhere on there do I ask, do, does the person coaching you have experience working with a beginner? All right, that's mm-hmm. important if you're a beginner. And he learned this because mm-hmm. he kind of used my thing mm-hmm. to try to find a guy to help him with MMA. Mm-hmm. So he found somebody that fit every criteria, but the guy really hasn't worked with a beginner forever. Mm-hmm. All right, but the, the, what you're talking about with him sharing post, I made a post. This is how good my brain works. And it's always interesting to me because whenever I make posts that deal with uh, personal accountability, mm-hmm. they, they don't do oh, for yeah. shit. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I, put, I made a post like four posts ago and, and that, that basically said, 
you don't deserve a goddamn thing. Yeah, you get what you get. You, you get okay. what you earn. Yeah. Nobody's sharing that shit. Because Nobody's putting that's, it around. That's what. That's my point. That's what I just said. Yes. Because people are like, oh well, fuck. But here, going back to where we started, if I was using social media to validate my worth or as advertising and so forth, it'd be like, oh shit, I need to delete that one. It's not doing well. Mm-hmm. All right, it's not getting the likes. It's not getting the engagements. It's not getting the saves. I need to delete it. I need to write something else. I need to stay away from that type of topic. Mm-hmm. All right, that's what people do. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's where you start to get the sli- you know, the slighted stuff because they don't want to see that. You know, they want to see this. Well, if you put in your time, fuck yeah, you deserve this. You deserve to be treated this way. You deserve to be treated this way. Well, mm-hmm. that may be true. But no, you don't. It's so, not from, guaranteed that it's going to happen. Exactly. Yeah. It's not guaranteed. Yes, there are ways that, you, that we have laws. You know, there's <laughs> laws in the country that everybody should follow. But that doesn't mean that that person's going to actually do it. Yeah. All right. So you, you see what I'm saying? So there, mm-hmm. there is that deserved and earned type thing. And if you put yourself in a position to where... You know, you're with somebody that's breaking the law, kind of beating the shit out of you and that kind of stuff. Well, then, yeah, you deserve to be treated in that. But this is a different type of thing. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? It's you get the fuck out. You know, you make the choice and do what you got to do to be able to <laughs> to get out of there. But you, obviously, they didn't earn that. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's where I put things out business-wise like that. They, th- those make me laugh. To me, those are some of my greatest accomplishments is if I can make a post that has like no engagement, you know, they but, just like read it and but, they're like, fuck. Yeah, but the only engagement <laughs> are from like people that you know are like, oh, you get it. It's like yeah. from fucking Murph or like yeah. Desenzo or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have this like reputation as being this ranting feminist whatever. And I guess I don't, I mean, maybe I shouldn't, Maybe there's a reason for that. Exactly. But I don't, I love it. I mean, I just, I just, you know, I'll just periodically just put stuff out there. I'm like, people are not going to like this. People are not going to like this. And I don't care. And so maybe, I mean, and I do, because here's the thing is I, I do the thing that I talked about before, which was all this information is like coming at me all the time. And like sometimes some of it like makes me like feel a certain way. And like, then I stop and I'm like, all right, I'm going to like, you know, generate some content, I'm going to put it out there. And so here's the thing, if people don't like it, like if they think, you know, whatever, I'm annoying and they're going to, because of I say stuff like that, I don't care because it made me, like, I mean, it made me happy. And I put, it, it, I put myself out there. And so I'm kind of arguing, like, to, you know, to anybody listening who's struggling with, you know, how they navigate this this train that we're talking about is like, dude, just, just try it. It's like, it's fun. It makes you laugh. Like it's, it's, I mean, and it doesn't ultimately like, I guess also I'm not really selling anything. Like, am I like not on my page? Like not really. I'm selling myself, but I, you don't need to buy it. Like, I don't care if you buy it. So I'm going to go ahead and put something out there. And it made me like, it, it helped me kind of just navigate stuff well. And I wish more people did it. Like, these are the people that I follow, people who are willing to do that, even if I don't agree with them like of course i'm not gonna agree with everybody all the time anyway but i love it when people are willing to do this because it it honestly it ends up bringing it enriches stuff it enriches things for me um and it shows me that like they've kind of evolved to the next point with how they're navigating a lot um so yeah i'm gonna keep doing it if people don't like it and it that that's that's the value of creative content you know and when you, when you like, uh, we, we've talked about this before on social media, like people can smell marketing. People can smell, uh, when they actually, when, when someone is trying to share something just for the engagement, like how many, how often have any of us seen the post where someone will write a pretty good long caption, but then at the bottom, they're like, what are your guys' thoughts? Or like, uh, just like leave a comment about blah, blah, blah. It's like, you you don't have to share you don't have to say uh comment like and su- subscribe at the end of every video because if it's good content and if it's good creative content people are going to do that you shouldn't have to encourage them to do so or do so or just use hot button topics to have that happen it should just happen naturally and that's 
yeah, that that's another aspect of like what we not vetting of information, but just sort of identifying what the information is on social media that we are consuming as the consumer that we're consuming and as the content creator, what we're actually putting out there. So I think it depends too on what the long term objective is, because a lot of the more professional long form marketing that we look at and laugh obviously works because I know people that are making a shit ton of money selling programs based upon that kind of crap. Mm -hmm. And the frustrating part is they know it's crap. They're paying to have it written, knowing it's crap. They're posting it, knowing it's crap, but they don't care because it's going to sell the program and it's going to make money. But their, their long term objective is not to be able to do this for the next 20 years or 15 years. Their objective may be, I want to get in here. I want to get out within five years, retire, never want to work again. Mm -hmm. So this is other stuff that customers need to vet as they go through because it's business, you know, it's business operates in many different facets and many different ways and many different styles. For instance, you know, we use, outsource manufacturers to the best manufacturers I could find, you know, and I want people who are really fucking passionate about building strength equipment and then give my input to be able to create products for the strongest athletes in the world. I don't want to be the person walking up floor trying to tell people that's not what I do. You know, I have the ideas on what I think needs to change and I let them figure that all out. Now I pay a percentage for that. You know, it's, it, I could very easily get a loan, set up shop, and deal with that but now there's more employees like idea i mean there's there's pros and cons you know the mm -hmm. one of the pros is i'm going to make a lot more money mm -hmm. you know because now it's all going to be in-house well and i and i could create jobs i could mm -hmm. create 60 probably 50 to 60 more jobs just within the next year of doing exactly what i'm saying but is it really creating jobs or am i displacing jobs because those jobs from the manufacturer that I currently use, or the two main three, two or three that I use, they, they won't be there mm -hmm. because we're a large percentage of their their business. So they're going to be laying a lot of people off. Mm -hmm. I'd rather keep working with the people that have are very that love building shit, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I love the ideas of coming up with things to make shit even more cool, and let them do that. Where that's that's one way of doing business where you're kind of sharing the profits, but you're not making the whole piece of the pie. You know, the other way is to bring it in, take the whole piece of the pie, say fuck you, and just you know keep growing that way. And that's how most business operates. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Now we'll bring it back to the online training. Same thing there. You got the online training, which is more of an intimate thing. You care about the person. You're trying to help them get better. You flip that to somebody that's putting together a program that's going to have a big launch, that's going to have hundreds and hundreds of programs sold, that's going to create you know, a boatload of fucking revenue and mm -hmm. kind of go that route where it's two different types of businesses. And as business owners, you can't get frustrated because you made your choice. Mm -hmm. Like I can't get frustrated because – competitors that manufacture and sell their own shit directly out of their own place. I can't get frustrated because they're making more or doing more, whatever it is. It's a choice I made mm -hmm. um, where the online trainer can't get frustrated about the person that's going the other route and selling all the books because that was the choice that they made. As long as you know, where you can get frustrated is at the frauds. All right. And that happens at, all levels mm -hmm. so you know even in the strength industry you got people that are import only just bringing in the cheapest shit mm -hmm. you know knock it off left and right <laughs> while that competes with anybody it hurts the direct you know manufacturers manufacturers that sell direct it definitely hurts them probably more than it's going to hurt us but it's still bullshit mm -hmm. you know because it's hurting the whole industry as a whole where in the online training sphere you have you know, the, the jokers that we were talking about that just set up camp after getting your program for 12 weeks and they think they know what they're doing and they're just going to set it up and just put it out there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's bullshit where at the same time you got people that will go find an ebook 
from 20 years ago. Basically, re-engineer, rewrite, you know, recraft, and repurpose the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Slap a label on Slap it. Slap a label on it. Mm -hmm. Hire a mark. Hire a copywriter. Knock the copy out. You know, build their name over a period of four, five, six months with creative content. Mm -hmm. You know, on social, boom, have your launch. You know, pull in whatever they can pull in. And then, basically, they're done mm -hmm. for at least six months, mm -hmm. a year. And then they can try to do it again. But it's funny if you watch some of these people because every time they do something like this, especially if it's strength-related, that's those are the ones that I seem to see happen more frequently. It's always like they're always putting 100 pounds on their bench. Like, man, this, this program put 100 pounds on my bench. And then... Like two years later, man, this program put 150 pounds on my bench. So mm -hmm. now, now you're up 250, and I know you started at like 200, so you're like a 450 bencher, but I kind of see what you're lifting, and it ain't fucking 450. Mm -hmm. In the next program, you're going to be fucking 600. Two more, yeah. you're two programs away from an all time world fucking record of 745 or some shit, mm -hmm. um, which is happens. I guess it's, it's, again, you can't get frustrated about the decision that you didn't make does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah. you know it's i mean you can be because it takes anything that seals your creative time and I, I believe this is true even as an individual anything that steals your creative time is is worth twice whatever you think your value is so if you were billing 150 dollars mm -hmm. you know an hour to train something anything that's stealing that creative time or any rabbit hole that you fall in mm -hmm. that's not helping you in any way that's three hundred dollars worth of value. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I put it out there. You know, and you can go down negative rabbit holes, which is fine because you need to see other points of view. You should understand other points of view. You know, as long as it's just not crap. You know, because we are different. Everybody has different points of view. Mm -hmm. Each generation have different points. You know, it's just you need to know that type of thing. But so there's that there's that rant whatever and, that was about yeah and then and then that can go back to what <laughs> we were talking about uh, uh vetting information and vetting the stuff that you take in that's a uh um an argument for having to like going against or having different viewpoints to view and like janice you said seeing people put out that creative content even if you disagree with them you still want to take it in because it's another perspective it's another point of view that you could potentially benefit from just by examining like well how did they get to that conclusion why do they think that way why do they go that route as opposed to the route that i've gone yeah as long as long as they're presenting it in a way that makes you think yeah you know if people are mm -hmm. just ranting and raving about whatever yeah, yeah. like this is bullshit because yeah, da, yeah. Da, 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 da. powerlifting like, needs to go back to the old way like, get, get, get yeah, out of yeah, here yeah. you know start yeah. giving me some points yeah and it's like ooh, fuck that makes a little bit of sense mm -hmm. you know made me think mm -hmm. you know people today don't, they don't want to think mm -hmm. like make me think about something Dude, you know? and that and that goes back to what we started off with where it's like what type of information are people taking in where it's like is it actually thought provoking or is it just scrolling is it just the reality show is it just the i'm gonna watch this for 10 seconds because it's going to fill my mind with noise because i don't want to fill it with anything else Yes. Yeah. I mean, what what happens if we don't think? Like, what is the easiest information to get in? Like, what's packaged to us to be easily, pleasantly, like, ingested information? Advertising. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Like, the there's so much now. I mean, it's almost like we've all learned how to, like, be little mini advertisements without realizing it. Um, this is something that I've, I've seen a lot. Like I can do it. Like any, I feel like it's just this, cr I mean, I see everybody do it without, I think even knowing that what they've done is they've learned how to speak in advertising speak. I don't, you know, they're not even necessarily advertising anything, but it's, it's like people, you know, are like, okay, I want somebody to like me. I want whatever, whoever is ingesting what I'm putting out there. I want them to like me. So it's it all comes back to like you know if you if you are advertising something you want people to like what they're hearing so if we're if we're going in autopilot and we're not thinking which means navigating something that you're not you know liking so much you know if you, if you get some piece of information if you get some viewpoint if you get some difficult to like 
deal with, you know, series of pieces of information. Um, that's just so much harder to deal with than advertising speak. But the problem here is if you don't push yourself to the level at which you're, you're questioning, you know, what you're hearing and, you know, you're like, hey, listen, I think this might be advertising speak, then you're going to just take whatever somebody gives you. Like, it comes back to taking responsibility to, to like, take the time to mentally process the information that you're getting and, like, ask if it's advertising speak, even if it's not directly advertising. <laughs> um, so that one, I mean, I just feel like that's rampant. Like, this is much more insidious. This is, this is like an entire issue of social media use of other, you know, just like human exchange that like nobody questions as much as they should. Um, you know, I think it's just all wrapped up also, it, you know, depending on, do people feel, you know, if you're offering a product even, like if you are advertising, you know, do you feel like, how do you want to, is it, is it, is there a push pull between like, I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror tomorrow, or I want to make a lot of money. And like, so sometimes I just wonder, there seem to be a lot of people who don't care if they can look at themselves in the mirror. Like, I'm, I'm serious. Like I, and like, and I'm like, and then there are people who are like, I do, like, I, I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror. And like, what, what's the point at which like somebody hits this, you know, like they don't care anymore if they, if they, you know, can look at themselves in the mirror. Like this, I know you're just like, where are you going with this? But like, I just, man, like I see this so much. And I'm like, I know that like, if somebody were to like put you in a chair in front of a little like, you know, trial situation and they were like, how can you justify this? Like, how can you justify ripping somebody off in this way? You know, I'm, like, I'm just really fascinated by how people find ways to justify like ripping people off in an online coaching situation, which isn't sustainable, you know, for within powerlifting or wherever. Um, you know, and I think these are things to once again, relate back to like somebody who's listening to this, like, this is the crap that you have to be asking yourself. You know, this is like when you're getting information shot at you from anybody from anywhere, like if this, if, if it's like, is this going to be good or bad for me to ingest as media? Like, you know, what do you think, where do you think the person, like, you know, the entity, whatever has arrived in terms of like how much it can look in the mirror and feel good about like what it's doing. It's a relevant question. You know what? Because I don't accept that everything is about making a buck in my world and maybe not everybody's world, but in my world, everything is not about making a buck and I don't think it has to be. And I'm going to seek out the things that aren't just about making a buck. So if you like are the same, then you can join me. And if you're not, then you can go elsewhere. The, the content, the interesting thing there is to kind of spin this tray just a little quarter direction, I guess, is we are in that, we're in a content business and it's free content, mind you, but it's supported by the products that we sell. But anyhow, our content has to be consumed for it to have value. All right. And if it's not consumed, then it's just a payroll expense, you know, that decreases the margins and so forth. But anyhow, so we have to watch what type of content we put out. When I said earlier, and it was, you know, JM kind of focused on it a little bit, and even Justin said a little bit of it. We said it here a couple times. People have lost the ability to think. If I look at the content, and if people look at the content that's consumed the most today, you know, across the board, micro blogs, short blogs. All right. So you're talking Instagram of 2000 characters or less, you know, Twitter, which is dealing with even less characters and long form podcast. So the, what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. oddly enough, something that can be digested very fast, you know, with, you know, a scroll micro content, right there many many hits a day so something that can be consumed while waiting in a grocery line at a stoplight wherever fast consumed then long form content something that can be consumed if you're driving for a long distance of time something that can be consumed if you're doing data entry type work at your job mm -hmm. so content that's curated and made to fill places where people would typically think is the most popular content that's there now. 
the least popular content are regular length articles, two to 6,000 words. Nobody wants to spend the time. And when you read an article, think about this. When you read an Instagram post, basically you got enough time to read the post, say, oh, okay. You know, there's not a whole lot to think about, mm -hmm. right? It's just, there it is, okay, pay for my groceries and leave. When you read an article, you're stopping through there, then you're stopping thinking, okay, does this make sense? You know, from tra training related, could I apply this to my training? Ah, maybe you take a note, maybe you circle it, you know, you know, copy and paste, throw whatever, move down, move down, move down. So even the articles are written in forms that are micro blog to be able to, to skim through, but they're longer. When's the last time anybody read a book? You know, so you throw that out there to the listeners. Like, when is the last time you actually read a book? Because you sit down to read a book, you know, you have to focus, you know, especially if mm -hmm. it's a nonfiction book and it's a story, which I can't stand to read. But you have to sit there and you focus and kind of follow the narrative. You know, do people possess the ability to even read a book like Game of Thrones or, or whatever the fuck it's called? Um, you know what I'm saying? Or anything mm -hmm. like that. Or a business, I tell people all the time, just read the the business books like i hate the trade over the counter business books i hate them with a passion but at least they make people think mm -hmm. when's the last time anybody who's an entrepreneur or who's a business owner who owns a business has actually picked up a book on business and read it that wasn't like gary v how to make more money with your fucking instagram or a strength coach or a power lifter yeah or anything because that shit sucks yes to sit down and read Yes. A lot of the time. Yes, and that I, that is my go-to source. Yeah. It's even more than the Kindle, mm -hmm. which I do use a lot, are you know going back to the super training, going back to the block training methodology and all that type of stuff. I still read about the strength training because it reminds me of things and it will bring up things that I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, a lot of years put into all that. I don't want to lose that you know, ability. And I, if I, I like that actually more than I do the business stuff, so i got to actually read both. But do people possess the ability, most of the listeners, to actually... I hear it all the time. I can't read super training. I'm like, I get that. Did you even try just looking in the back? Because mm -hmm. in the back, it's some of the easiest shit you could read. It's like, here's the mm -hmm. super set. Here's the tri mm -hmm. set. Here's a giant set. Just start with what you understand. Mm -hmm. and then, I mean, it's a textbook, for Christ's sake. It doesn't have to be read. And Yeah. And, and, that, and that's like... People, people will ask me, because I have, I have my CSCS, and a mm -hmm. lot of people struggle with that test and it's not it's not exactly an easy test but if you know what to look for like if you're out there reading a textbook like super training or mm -hmm. the the strength and conditioning manual or whatever they make it so that you can understand it's not just it's not a like game of thrones where it's just words words yeah. there's little blurbs there's a little mm -hmm. block here and a little block here go in and fucking look at the blocks Oh you yeah, know, yeah. The if the, like God, if it, it it's not made so that it's impossible to read, and I just I I don't know how many of the listeners are actually sitting down and reading. Like that's honestly been one of the one of the most beneficial things that I've done over this past year. I've spent a bunch of money on textbooks and just books in general, just because I'm I make it a point to sit down and read and take notes and think. Like you, you were talking about journaling every day and it's, it's, it's getting more familiar with that ability to think about what you're doing and understand what, what it is, what the information actually is that you're taking in as opposed to at a stoplight or before we were on the show, like just scrolling and being like, this is what you're doing wrong or the little, the little X and then the check mark. And it's like, yeah, okay. Tap, tap, mm -hmm. tap. Cool. You know, cause you're not thinking there. You're, you're just, you're, it's, it's like JM was talking about palatability with food. You know, when you eat McDonald's, you can just press it against the roof of your mouth. You don't have to actually have to chew it. Um, it's the same thing. It's you actually go, it's, it's this situation versus that situation where you're either going to McDonald's and getting a, a quarter pounder and super ease of access, like don't really have to work at anything or you're buying ground beef and rice and broccoli and 
this and you have to cook it at home and then you have to wait for it to cool down a little bit and then you have to eat it that's a much more drawn out process compared to the quarter pounder so it's like the palatability of the food and the palatability of the information it's not the easiest thing to digest sometimes yeah but that's a skill that you can refine and it's a it's a skill that they not only need to refine they they need to do because it's it's very easy to sit and listen to people talk on a podcast about training and you're going to retain it's i don't know what the reten- retention is from podcasting but i know if i was to give a presentation or a seminar and it was a three-hour seminar people at most will retain three things you know so one one thing per hour you know that obviously goes up if you're reading what people i don't think understand is you know, it, it's easy to sit and listen. It's easy to sit and read a microblog that's written very basically. You know, it's whenever you're learning something new, regardless of what it is, it's going to be uncomfortable and hard mm-hmm. because you've never been exposed to it before. So you really don't even need to read it. You just need to scan it the first time. Mm-hmm. Just glance over, just read through. I mean, this is how people learn to speed read, by the way. But mm-hmm. anyhow, you just glance it through and you just become familiar with, okay, here's what this is. Put it away, set it down. You know, then especially for coaches, when you're dealing with some of the books that I feel are some of the most important, you know, super training, science and practice, strength training, and other ones that you can Google search, whatever my list is, you need to really know that shit. So you got to get past the point of just reading it to where you've gone back and you've highlighted it and you've taken notes and you've acted like you've had to take a test on this. And the minimum score that you can get on this test is 100%. It's pa- it's, that's pass or fail. You either know it or you don't. And that's the level that you want to get with some of the most important books in the strength conditioning industry. And the, I'll make this very simple for because I know it's going to come in. What books do you recommend? Here's what you do, guys. This is very, really simple. Search the best strength and conditioning textbooks and read everybody's list. I don't care if it's a nobody, you know, or an expert. Find the books that are on everybody's list because there's going to be a few that are going to turn up on every single list. Start with those. All right. That's pretty easy. Mm-hmm. The super training is pretty much going to be on all of them because mm-hmm. even if it's a slap dick, they're going to throw it on there. Super training. Yeah, they're going to throw it on there because everybody else did. Mm-hmm. But that's a good place to start because everybody's putting out their own list. So there's going to be overlap, tremendous overlap because of that. Start there. And then learn those. And then when you're communicating, some of the craziest questions I have or conversations I have are with trying to help people with programs and they'll dm a question and it's about peaking or whatever it's going to be and it's i don't even know the context of this is this a block model is this conjugate you know Mm -hmm. what what the fuck is this Mm -hmm. and i'm trying to establish the communication for them to be able to tell me what what the hell it is and then they can't and Mm -hmm. it's like send me last you know it, then yeah. I, all of a sudden i got like a half hour vested in it just trying to figure out if this is fucking block training for or because they want to do art the the upper the, back yeah, good the, morning yeah, thing yeah, yeah, yeah. like where does this fit i'm yeah. like oh. yeah after watching 50 people do it yesterday it's you know where does it fit you know it's like nowhere you know (laughs) it's just like do it when you can (laughs) yeah yeah i mean it's just so that's i from a coaching perspective though i really think that they need to have that background to at least be able to have conversations with other coaches when they're together to be able to discuss programming because you can't discuss programming if you don't even know what the basis is that mm-hmm. they're actually coming from. Mm-hmm. And then when you can, then it's like, oh, okay, I get that. I can, I can take myself out of this conjugate bias, put myself over here, you know, into the block. Now let's talk about this. And then just forget all about this, this other shit. You know, I don't need to, you're not mm-hmm. going to convince, I'll tell you this right now. I've been doing this a long time. You're not going to convince a block person to change the fucking conjugate or vice versa. Mm-hmm. You just learn the different things. And then you learn how to, you know, help the person who needs the help on where they need the help. Mm -hmm. You know, your job isn't to convince them to some completely different philosophy that they don't Mm -hmm. know anything about. That's not my job. 
you know, mm-hmm. maybe that's somebody else's job that's got a vested interest in doing that. But the person selling that particular yeah, program, yeah, yeah, that's 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 not mine. My mm-hmm. job is to make sure to help the person become better. Mm-hmm. And that goes back to like again, it's uh, people's ability to learn and have those discussions. Because how many times have you and I been in here and been talking and exchanging ideas about like speed work versus tempo work, like controlling the eccentric, why I think overspeed eccentrics are stupid, Mm -hmm. why you think they're beneficial and whatnot. And I've, I've had a thousand discussions with people on the internet about this because I'll, I'll put it out. Like I remember two weeks ago uh, when I was in Michigan, I did my Friday Q and a, and I, I said, somebody was like, if you had to choose between the two, would you choose speed work or tempo work? And I, I, I don't know your answer, but well, what, what is your answer? Well, temp- if, if, uh, speed is tempo. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. that, I need to know, I need. If, you know, in, for the sake of the argument, they were, the way I interpreted it, interpreted it as was, would you either work speed work, so explosive concentric work, with the the conventional speed work, so like mm-hmm. overspeed eccentric, explosive concentric, versus tempo work, where it was let's say for instance a five second eccentric into a explosive concentric. In what type of training model? It, exactly, there it's it's so open ended. Mm-hmm. But the, again, I just assumed because it's the Q and A, so I'm doing a lot of assumptions. I just looked at it as block training because this, the person that asked it was just doing like. It looked basic, like a very basic Americanized mm-hmm. style of block training. Yeah. See, because if, if it's, let's say they were to take that out of a conjugate approach mm-hmm. and then put it in and replace their dynamic day, they've actually almost, depending upon the, the weight, created two, four mm-hmm. max effort sessions per mm-hmm. week, which they'll never recover from. Mm-hmm. So it's, it under, this is like, like I'm saying, the coaches need to understand the different principles behind it because... Mm-hmm. Um, speed work is a, it's actually a it's a it's a it's a big one it's mm-hmm. one it's a big one to really understand because you know some people can maintain that explosive quality if some people you can't build it you know it's just mm-hmm. flat out there's just some people it's rare but you really can't but you can definitely maintain it some people you can build it to a certain point and then hold it you know for Actually, Ted can hold for about four, maybe five weeks, and that's it. Mm-hmm. So I can stop speed work five weeks out before me and then start working on, that's why it turns into more of a, a progressive overload the mm-hmm. last five weeks. But if mm-hmm. he begins to lose a little bit of speed and you see it on his um, warm-ups, we can fix that with just one or two sets of light box jumps in the middle of the week, mm-hmm. brings it back up. But that's kind of a block model. But if that speed quality gets lost, let's say you put the speed work in and it's block one of four, right? Mm-hmm. And then you, you're working with athletes that need to be explosive. And then it's, you know, speed, then strength one, transition, strength two, you know, and then, you know, transfer, which is transference for the sport. And then into the sport, they're, they're going to be, their explosive components, it's going to suck. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, hypertrophy is a, a component that can be blocked and maintained for a long period of time, you know, actually months, as long as there's just a little bit kept in there. Mm-hmm. They pull it completely after eight weeks, it'll drop. Strength is a component you can't get that fucking far. That's why it's usually the last block, you mm-hmm. know, that, that power, you know, that strong power phase is the last block. But if people don't understand, you see, you see get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So we can have conversation, we have the conversations about the speed work and stuff like that. It's like, okay, where does it fall in context? Mm-hmm. And I hope my brief explanation here explains to people, you know, if it's too far out, you know, in a block model, it can actually be detrimental. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it really depends, you know, and mm-hmm. some people may not even need it. Mm-hmm. You know, and oh my God, now I got all the conjugate people fucking jumping, you know, freaking out. It's, Dave it, just said this, yeah. you know, but I have my bias, which I've made very clear, but that doesn't mean I don't understand block training extremely well mm-hmm. and have pivoted and used both. You know, I think optimally that's where a coach should be, mm-hmm. you know, because changing waters, man, you know. People can do real good, man. People can do real good. Just kick ass, and all of a sudden, boom, Mm -hmm. stuck. 
Mm -hmm. Injury one, injury two. You know, after like 10 injuries, it's like, oh, shit. You know, now we got to really look at a a vast. We got to change vessels, Mm -hmm. man. We need to get a bigger ship or we've got to do something, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I I know, and that's uh that's sort of that that was my response to the person. I, I it's it's just it's so contextual with with all of that, and one of one of the things that you and I have have discussed to no end in here is like the the bands creating stability because of like such an intense amount of band band tension being in if there was a skeleton there it would be an axial load it's directly down so it sort of grounds you so it takes the demand away from the individual to ground themselves to root themselves and then my whole argument and this is because i i said in my answer i was like in it it really depends but in this context i would say control and tempo would be more valuable to you and then i had a guy who runs conjugate i can't remember his name but it was actually a pretty good discussion but he absolutely took offense took offense to it and he jumped down my throat and was like this is bullshit you have no idea what you're talking about and then we just we went back and forth and the way that i i looked at it and the value your ability to see the value in both situations it comes to play here because you ha- I tend to think about it in terms of traction control. If you have a, a top thrill, like the, one of those dragsters with the big ass tires on the back, they go from like zero to 120 in like whatever, however many seconds. If you, they have traction control because those engines are powerful no matter what. Those engines can produce power. That power is you, that is your muscles. They can produce that explosive contraction in mo- in in most any situation if you have any semblance of speed but the asphalt that you are on so the environment that you're in your how how stable your surface is that is what is receiving that power so if the traction control in a in a vehicle basically will prevent too much power from going out because if if the if the environment is too locked in those tires will literally fly off the vehicle. That's a, a, a tendon tear. If the environment is too loose or unstable, so like if you're flooring it on a sheet of ice, th- you're not going to go anywhere. It's not going to put that much power out because then you're just going to spin in a circle. That's the individuals who have, have those ban- that much band tension and they're killing all these weights, like just fucking shit up in training, but then they get to the meet and they go to pick it and they're mm-hmm. this how last week I had the chains that were grounding me, and then uh, this past Tuesday I hit that 850, and I'm so fucking unstable because I haven't had that straight weight in so long. But that's why with like we talked about my last training cycle, I w- I would always try to peak peak not peak but hold on to too much strength for too long, and it's taken me got fucking 11 years to figure this out. But, like, I realize now, okay, this first week is going to suck because I'm going to feel unstable. I'm, I'm three and a half weeks out now. Next week is going to be a little bit heavier weight. I'm going to be more locked in. The week after that, I'm going to be more locked in, but I'm not going to show, I'm not going to do it in the gym because I'm going to deload and I'm going to recover and be incredibly locked in for the meet. It's all about context and what environment you are being able to produce that power in, how stable you are. Yeah, that yeah. The environment also constitutes what's being done on the other days. Mm-hmm. So let's say you're yes. using a ton of band tension and you're using um, a block training where you're, you got three squat days per week. You know, that mm-hmm. you can't do it. You mm-hmm. got to be able to recover from it. You know, so the recover ability isn't even there because it's hard you know, it's easy to recover from a box squat. It's definitely easier to recover from that than it is a regular squat. You start throwing bands and shit on there, it becomes more of a recovery demand. Now you throw bands and it's actually, you know, really, really heavy bands on there. Then all of a sudden, that next max effort day may not be a max effort day. It may be some kind of lighter repetition method or something like that mm-hmm. to go to know that. But the context is everything. And it's, I wish more people knew that and the guy that's jumping your ass needs this is where an, another problem that's kind of in the industry needs to understand that you're talking about programming you're not talking about his personality 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's like people take offense to your position on a training program. Mm -hmm. You have positions on a lot of other things too. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. what the fuck? It's a training program. It's, you, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. You it's know? like, <laughs> you don't train this way, so fuck you. Yeah, I don't like you. Yeah, and it it's goes, like, well, yeah. Yeah, it's like, like it's it's fucked up. You yeah. know, it's just, and if you really know your shit, you should be able to argue just as strong for it as you can against it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a fun game that I like to play mm -hmm. with. And I don't run into it very often, but mostly when I run into it is it is with, collegiate strength coaches you know they think that you know they're the holy grail and they don't know you know to me they don't know their ass from the ground but mm -hmm. to start getting them in conversations that are taking them out of their wheelhouse with different styles of programming and they're have no clue whatsoever meanwhile their client is a beginner mm -hmm. when it comes to weight training they're they're like my 15 year old son mm -hmm. it's like so you have this elaborate program that's set up for you know an elite olympic athlete for somebody who can't even squat with do do a pull up or, or yeah. pull up yeah you know it's, it's it doesn't make sense you know it's just ridiculous but they can argue you know mm -hmm. they can they can stay as long as they're in their wheelhouse mm -hmm. then it's like well what are the negatives of that mm-hmm well, there are none. That's why I do it. Okay, so that means this would work for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, there's always there's always pros and cons. Mm -hmm. I feel like maybe we should address like a few questions. Yeah. Or? Well, people on the I have the because I can't read that, mm -hmm. but um, people were saying like, when are they going to ask questions or, or answer right. questions? So yeah, we can do that. Is that on YouTube? That there? Yeah. I got some right here we can start with, or whatever. And then we can get to the YouTube ones at the end there. But uh, the first one, first one here says, "How do you deal with high high life stress going into a competition? Uh, it's been a crazy month, and I compete in two weeks, and shit's been wild. So, how do you keep your faith and mindfulness high during times like these?" Well, it goes back to what we were sort of talking about: uh, getting your. I don't want to say get your mind right because I fucking hate that like whole like just believe in yourself and you'll be fine no that's it's it still sucks um but you can't like what dave said sort of that stoic philosophy is uh you can control what you can control and you can't control what you can't control i would go on to further say that like if this guy is if if you the person who asked that question is having a lot of life stress because of work deadlines or relationship stuff or whatever, think about what you are allowing to affect you. Um, if, if you, if you're, if, if your significant other and you are arguing or something or something along those lines, or there's an, a great deal of stress from that, uh, sort of consider what you are allowing. Like you, don't have to respond you don't have to engage uh or you can choose how deeply you are doing that at that current moment or you or or draw or draw boundaries for yourself like that's been a huge thing that i've i've had to work on this past year is like if you are if you're in the gym and you're training and like you are devoting 2 hours of your time to that you can say like not, and, and I'm not saying talking, like saying it to your significant other or saying it to your boss or anything like that, but I'm saying say it to yourself. Like in this moment, I am going to work at not thinking about X or not thinking about Y. It's a really difficult thing to do initially, but it is something to be mindful of and it's something to work on that's been a huge, a huge thing for me. Like my, my past year has been also wild, you know? Um, but there would come a time where it's like, all right, in this moment, I am not going to put my energy there. I can for every other 22 hours of the day if I need to, but for right now, I am not, I am choosing this over that right now. 
Well, I also think um, something to remember if you feel if you're heading into a meet and you're like, oh, man, like all this stuff is happening or like this stuff is happening, period. Um, what you want to remember is that very likely you've been having crud blow up, you know, in your life while you've been training for months. I think people like are like, I'm doing a meet. OK, so it all has to be perfect. And it's like, hell no, like it's not going to be. Um, and if you. And when you see it, I think, you know, we're all control freaks. We're not, maybe, hopefully we're not, but I definitely am. When you see things start to go out of control, like you, you're like, oh man, I, you know, this is really bad and I have a meet coming up. This is really bad. You have to back up and just be like, wait, <laughs> there's been stuff happening while I've been training for this sport for a long time. Like bad things are always happening. Like I'm always stressed out. Um, and then you can be like, okay. I'm going into a meet. It's just another dude. I'm going to go that day and I'm going to do nine attempts. And like, it's just another training day, except some, you know, it's, it's a platform. So just remind yourself of that. I mean, what I will tell you is that leading into the meet that I did in 2017, um, where I did the 132 deadlift record, um, I am pretty sure that I did not get more than five hours of sleep a night. I'm not exaggerating. Um, for like months heading into that, I, uh, got a new job like a month before, doing that meet like I knew like when I went to that meet I knew that I was like quote-unquote stressed out but I I don't and dude I, by the way I'm a stress case so I'm not sitting here s speaking because Joe knows this like he's around me in training all the time I'm a freaking stress case but what I did do is I was just like all right I'm doing this meet um you know my body actually seems to be pretty up for it it's just my head that's kind of like oh god I'm so stressed so I was like shut the hell up and just go you're always stressed and the meet went very well so try to like not feel like everything has to be perfect. Remember that. Um, I'm going way back. I did maybe two meets when Elite FTS was founded or when I was really, when we were really an entity that wasn't just like out of the house, <laughs> just me trying to make something out of nothing. And then I had plenty of meets when I was still working as a personal trainer. My approach was kind of the same way, training-wise, and it was kind of really the last six weeks are the only time that really needed balanced or needed unbalanced, extremely unbalanced is be a better way to say that. So when I was still working as a trainer, I let my manager know I ran the training program that for that period of time I basically would be working but I did not want to be in control of time cards you know I didn't want to be in control of commissions I did not want to be in control of there were certain parts that I would have pulled off of my plate that just were like busy work that just frustrated the shit out of me that I didn't like to do because I didn't like to do it I didn't want it to be part of my life and then he would do it for me. And then I would do the same thing for him, you know, if he went on vacation or something like that. So it was a trade. So I tried to clear, like when I said before, there are certain things you control and certain things you can't. I did try to control everything that I could control. And some of the clients that were clients that drove me nuts, I would tell them, look, you know, there, there's no, I've always been transparent. I'm like, there's no, you know, you drive me fucking crazy and this is just going to be worse the last four weeks. So you're going to be working with Allison for the next four weeks. And so I took a little bit of a hit because I was working less hours and that's where the less hours would come from as I went and work with the people that would drive me fucking crazy. I just kind of pulled them out, put them off to somebody else and they always came back. So it wasn't, it wasn't a thing where they felt like they were being jaded because communication's vital, you know, when I'm trying to do this. And then that allowed me then to be able to not have to train any clients on Friday, which was a squat day. So I'd squat in the morning, and for me, the dynamic work would just wore the shit out of me. Then I'd have all the rest of the day, I could just go home and just chill. When I was at All Elite FTS, then it was, you know, Jim and Tracy. The six weeks before that, like, you know, guys, look, I really probably shouldn't be one handling customer service the last six weeks before me. Um, if it's hot as fuck in here, you know, I'm going to go work from home. You know, so there are certain things like that that were controlled, but then always kind of made up from that standpoint. 
it also gave me, and it didn't create more mental stress. It didn't even reduce mental stress. It just put me in a better physical state to be able, because I had a lot of nagging injuries all the time that needed taken care of. And it was harder back then to do that than it is today. You know, today you got a million different modalities to be able to do therapy and recovery type of work where I was kind of stuck with a sled, you know, in a band and trying to do that and not um, become accustomed to it, you know, because you can adapt to the recovery modality and then it not work, you know, try to pull that out. So those are the things that I did. And it was, you know, I would tell my wife, you know, look, you know, this the last six weeks and she kind of knew what that meant, kind of how that went from there. And then the hard part for me though, was when I was at Westside, there was no fucking off season. So if we had a meet on Saturday and we were training on Sunday, so it's all these people that are doing you these favors to try to, it's hard to kind of pay them back, you know, for that. Cause you're right back into the mix while it's not as hard mentally demanding, you're still in the gym just as much, except for the recovery days. So that was more my sphere, which is probably the most extreme. You know, it's, I know some people that just quit their work and pull themselves off social media completely. I think that that's a mistake, you know, for people to do that because they're, they're flipping their life around too much that, you know, even the steps that you take per day walking around is workload. So if you take that from a normal 8,000 steps per day all the way down to like 500, you're going to be like, I'm going to be recovering great, but actually you're not because you don't have the circulation that you would have normally had. So your recovery is actually worse, you know, and you're, you may not get the meal. So you want to try to keep as many things normalized as you possibly can and not freak out. You know, it's, I, so I didn't have any problem with <clears throat> with that aspect of it if it was ever that aspect it's just like the meats that I went into hurt just being like all right at some point in time I know I'm gonna have to flip this and say I may end up in a hospital before the end of the day and fuck it it's the way it is but then again not worry about it because you can sit and stress about it you, that you know if it's a hamstring or one time I went into a meet with a pec tear that was two weeks out I can sit and stress about that for two weeks but it's still not going to change the fact that I'm going to get on the platform and bench so it's, it's not going to change it so just try not to worry about it and anytime you do worry about something stop yourself and tell yourself this is self-talk you know which goes back to something we alluded to earlier just tell yourself stop I'm not going to have this conversation and then switch it and go find something else to do and if you got to say that a hundred times an hour, say it a hundred times an hour, stop. I'm not going to have this conversation. Everything's fine. Then go on and do what you have to do and develop that habit and you'll be fine. All right. Uh, next one we got, what are your thoughts on people with mild, dis mild physical disabilities getting into powerlifting competitions? Who would think bad about what? I think here's something I will say. I mean, it's not like, oh, that's bad. No, okay. Nobody's definitely going to say that. Here's something I will say, though. Um, um, when I was back at the University of Iowa, um, we there were a few instances in which we that was kind of like a thing with somebody who joined up with the powerlifting club or somebody who was related to it within the community. Um, you know, they'd want to do a meet, and they had like some thing physically that you could put into the category of disabilities. So what I would say to people who are kind of like in this position or, you know, somebody in their lives, a friend, whatever is in this position where they want to, is like, you may have to work, you may have to kind of work to find a meet situation that will make certain accommodations. Um, because some of them, like, I don't even want to get into the politics of this, but I kind of do, but I, I won't. Do some it. of them, I mean, I don't know. I don't know specific. I mean, like, dude, there's just some feds are like, nope, like, we need to do one tiny thing so that this person with this, you know, tiny situation, like, they can get up on the platform. I mean, they're probably not breaking a world record. We're still not going to let them do it. Even if they were, could be like, I know what you're saying. I just don't think you know. The situations in which it's occurred but like uspa and usapl have both turned down records oh, because yeah. people because like the rule is your feet have to touch the ground but then if a motherfucker doesn't have legs mm -hmm. but then they're still oh. breaking records they're like well technically this is a bad lift and yeah. then yeah. it's just like are you yeah 
No, I know. Uh, I it, yep. like so it's that's just stupid as fuck. Like that's dumb as fuck, and that's why I think every federation is stupid. But like, well, yeah. Okay. Continue. What I what I do want to say is that I will give. I'm gonna do a shout out thing or whatever here. Like UPA. UPA um, <laughs> okay, the UPA. Um, accommodating. <laughs> <laughs> they actually um there were several instances in which we kind of went to bill and we were like uh hey we got this lifter with this situation um you know can they compete you might have to do this or this with it and he would be like okay because he's a human and he cares i mean it was just it was cool so what i'm saying is you may have to work a little bit to find that it is out there but I, you know powerlifting gets real high on itself sometimes and um Sometimes, like, people who really should, you know, be able to get on the platform, like, you know, there's some federations need to get over themselves. So, it, yeah. It's creating more barriers to yep. entry, and it's just completely unnecessary. Uh, because, like, and recently, uh, the UPA, the Dubuque meet, whatever, because I've never done them, but I've heard nothing but good things about them. Um, what's her face? The one chick, uh, Chloe. Chloe. Yeah, uh, what's her last I don't name? know. It's male on Instagram. Yeah, I know that's it, not it. But I, like, she's got like I didn't fucking know, but she pulls with straps because her hands all yeah, fucked up. Strap, yeah. yeah, and like, it's he said that's fine, mm -hmm. and then in my head because I'm an asshole, I'm like, well, should that count on the all time win? I don't know. And then like I, I was like, ah, fuck it. But who knows? It's like, but the fact is, she approached him. Mm -hmm. And said, like, hey, can I... Well, I'm assuming, because I don't really know her that well. I've talked to her a couple of times. But um, I'm sure she was like, hey, is this legal? Does Do you mind? And they're like, sure, fuck it, you know? Because it's not as if she can control that. No. And I'm almost positive she is going to do the U.S. Open next year, and they're being accommodating for it, too. Oh, they are? Yeah, okay, I believe nice. so. Okay. Um, because it's, it's not as if she can control that. Like, she didn't fucking choose to, like chop her fucking hand in half or something you know or whatever the fuck that issue is but like it's you know it, it just to the person that asked that question and i know the person that asked that question because she and i have spoken uh, a little bit um just reach out to the meat director reach out to the meat director if you are planning to go compete be transparent about your issue about what whatever it is that might be a barrier of entry and communicate with them if you have a good meet director, if you uh, if if you are entering a competition where it it's an understanding human on the other end of it, and it's not one of the more bureauc bureaucratic federations, which nothing against them, but they kind of are, um, they'll probably be understanding because it's just it's it's powerlifting. It supposed it's supposed to be welcome for everybody, but you know just talk to the meet director. That's that's what I would say. And I think it's great. Like, if you have a disability, like, fuck, everybody should be doing some type of strength training, so just do something. I love powerlifting, so powerlift. What, the question was mild disability? Mild, uh, mild physical dis disability. So what, what constitutes a mild physical disability? I believe she has muscular dystrophy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, but so I'm, I'm looking at it from a non-federation standpoint. <clears throat> As a parent of a kid that's on the spectrum you know the one of the things in my opinion but it's shared by many others that i can't fucking stand are the the rigged football play that allows the autistic kid to score the touchdown mm -hmm. you know or things like that fuck that if they want to participate let them participate as an equal you know that's why they're there you know, it's now if you need to make certain accommodations for what you're talking about because they mm -hmm. don't have fingers to grab a bar. I get that. I understand that. That's more federation person type thing. I'm talking competitor to competitor. Mm -hmm. Treat them like yeah, another competitor. Yeah. Treat them like another lifter. Don't treat them like they're some fucking different foreign different species. Yeah. You know, it's, they're they're a lifter the same way you are. You mm -hmm. know, you share the same passion. They should be treated with the same passion. They shouldn't be given you know, a red carpet to get to the fucking platform to lift, you know, mm -hmm. make them have to fight through the same crowd. Everybody else has to fight through to go lift, make them feel a part of mm -hmm. what's actually going on, you know? So I don't want to say, you know, don't go out of your way. You know what I'm saying? But those people that know what I'm talking about, know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you'll see in meets, it's, you'll have somebody and it's just a, all of a, all of a sudden this is the, the greatest lifter in the world. 
You know, the guy just wants to do a meet, or the girl or whoever just wants to do a meet. Let them do mm -hmm. the fucking meet. Mm -hmm. Let them experience the meet. You don't have to fucking stand on chairs, you know, for their third attempt squat. You know, just let them do the fucking meet. Treat them like a fucking lifter. They're mm -hmm. going to remember that mm -hmm. more than they're going to remember, you know, being treated like a disabled person that they get treated like mm -hmm. everywhere else they mm -hmm. fucking go. I think we can do better than that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, <clears throat> Any uh, comprehensive recommendations for a heavy set guy to cut or otherwise lean out while strength training, or is it simply a calorie equation? If continuing to train hard and progress, does this situation tend to, to solve itself? Pass. That just, yeah. Identify your goals. If you want to lose weight, lose weight. If you want to get stronger, get stronger. I mean, I just feel, you know, these things come up repeatedly. These, these, this kind of question, um, this concern. And I just feel like it, it comes from this place where, I mean, I have like, I don't want to say sympathy because like that sounds weird, but in a way I, I really do have a lot of sympathy for people who are just like, man, like I have this, like, should I do this? What should I do? Like my body composition is this. And it's like, all I can tell you is that, you know, really as JM has said, the basics are where the answers are, and yeah. you know that. Yep. And here is the other thing in, real, in um, addition to the basics is time is the other answer. It's going to be the basics plus time and consistency. And you know that. So whoever is asking any of these questions, I'm going to give them credit for knowing what I just said. But what's hard is, you know, just butting up against hey, the onslaught of information, the onslaught of images, the onslaught of, like, you know, ideals in so many ways, strength, body image, et cetera, that, that we're all faced with, and then just, like, kind of getting, like, squirrely mentally and being like, I got to, okay, what's going to, I need to fix something. It's like, dude, you don't need to fix anything. You just need to work. And, like, then it will work itself out, as I think the question was, like, whatever. It will. Like, I, I promise you, if you adhere to like those kind of three things and it's going to take years and nobody wants that answer years don't turn into dollars not directly not quick um and they don't give you instant gratification and i trust me i know this like myself personally i struggle with this myself on so many levels all the time so i have like i said sympathy for this question but like you know the answer um I've been asked this question so many times, so I finally decided I'm going to give the exact fucking answer, right? So most people who ask this are probably 300 pounds or more, right? Mm -hmm. Guesstimate on how many calories it takes to maintain is usually times 20. So, dude, you need 6,000 calories on average to maintain your body weight. So that's at 300 pounds. Now, out of that, you're going to want to make sure about 40% of that is coming from protein. Keep in mind, protein is four calories <clears throat> per gram. gram. And a carbohydrate is going to make up, uh, let's say another 40 percent of this with the uh, carbohydrates also being four and then the fats are going to make up the remaining which that's nine if you drink alcohol fuck it that's seven you're going to reduce the calories by 500 on the first week and then each week thereafter you're going to reduce by 250 throughout the whole training cycle after the first four weeks actually for your training you're going to reduce all training in the percentages by 15 percent on week one so if it says 60 uh, percent uh, for it's two sets of eight you're going to take 15 percent off that 50 percent for the first four weeks after the next four weeks you're going to pull another five percent off because you're dropping weight and you're dropping weight pretty rapidly but at that time you're also going to pull an additional 500 extra calories so now you should be around 4,000 calories at this period of time and your training you need to take another five percent off the top of whatever that max is now about that time is when you should go through a circumax phase all right so what I'm really saying is the answer you want is not the fucking answer you're going to get. The answer you want is fucking decide what's the highest priority. 
losing weight or gaining strength. You can go about it two different ways. You can maintain your caloric intake, keep your diet basically the same. Try not to let your appetite, because training will increase your appetite. Try not to let your appetite go higher. It will. But try not to eat more because of it. And just start fucking training hard. You will start losing a little bit of fat. You can train weight loss if, as long as you're keeping the calories the same. It's going to be slow, but that's if strength is the actual number one priority. If fat loss is the number one priority, don't worry about the fucking strength. Lose the weight first, then build the strength. If I was to give my opinion, I would say lose the weight first, yes. then take care of the strength because the weight loss, it's easier to do. All right, it's easier to drop the weight and harder to maintain. The strength is easier to gain and harder to maintain. So mm -hmm. it's an opposite impact on that. So you can lose the strength with the weight loss and gain it back pretty pretty easy. It's, it's maintaining the strength that becomes the hardest entity as you keep dropping. So make your choice. For most people that I've talked to, the choice is always usually with weight loss. They want to drop the weight. So pull the weight off. Don't worry about it. Really good time, though, if you want training advice. If that's the case and you know there's a possibility you're going to lose strength, just create a training program for yourself that just focuses on dialing in your technique mm -hmm. to the greatest degree. I mean, be super, super yeah. anal about it. Like technique insane like everything yeah. by the time you lose the 50 pounds yeah. there will be nothing wrong with your technique yeah. it will be spot on yeah. so you might never use more than 135 mm -hmm. you may never use more i mean but then when you start training again you're you're going to be 100 pounds stronger in the squat and pull guaranteed just because your technique's better because I'm sure mm -hmm. it sucks, just like everybody else we see. Mm -hmm. And the bench is going to be 50 pounds back. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be, you're going to have 250 pounds more in your total, even if you never used over 225 for any mm -hmm. of those lifts, if mm -hmm. you just focus on the technique. Um, side note, that's actually, sometimes people are like, how do I get through a really boring period in my training? Like at, coming off of a meet, like, you know, you, you do a meet and you're like, oh God, I'm so depressed now. Like, you know, I don't get to do cool things. So one of the ways that I've gotten myself mentally through those periods is to be like, focus on technique. Like we're going to go in there and make that the thing that gets better. And it's just such a rich, like there's so much that you can do to put in work in the gym. I don't know why more this isn't a thing that more people are like automatically like, come off of me. All right, I'm going to fix like this and this and this and this and this is wrong with my technique. Just like, I don't care what the weight is. Just go mentally be like, yay, I'm fixing technique today. It's like, I think that's a great thing to go to. So, mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's all it is. It's just identify your goals, figure out what you want. And because the person led with, I'm a heavy set guy. That just tells me you want to lose yeah. weight. Like, so look at, literally go look at my Instagram. I just put that photo up, uh, from like 2011. That was, it's, it's me like dancing on, on the Wii in front of like my high school friends. Um, but it's, that's after I lost, uh, over, I think it was like 80 pounds at that time because I was so fat as a kid, but I figured out like, I need to lose the weight. And back then I didn't know I was doing this, but I, I thought I would lose the weight and then I would be jacked. I would see like the guy, I'd see the Dragon Ball Z characters and like the guys in like men's health. And I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be fucking ripped as soon as I get down to like 170. It's gonna, I'm gonna look so fucking good. And I looked like a Holocaust survivor. My face was sunken in. I got a big ass chin and a big ass head. So I looked like a Pez dispenser. It was fucked up. <laughs> but, uh, I just, I did that first. I lost all that weight, and then I'm like, fuck, okay, I actually have to build muscle now. But then, as soon as I go into a caloric surplus, after being in a caloric deficit for so long, your body is like, like it, wa it wants to suck all that food in. And that's better than any fucking steroid out there, because you're just like, holy shit, I feel amazing. I can have like... A, like a couple of potatoes before going to the gym i'm fucking i'm like turning red and sweating and swollen and it's fucking great you know so just identify your goals first and just because you phrased it that way i would say lose the weight first all right um speaking of food what's all three of your favorite foods to consistently consume for training i don't have anything salt and, vin salt and vinegar pringles 
<laughs> it's it's really weird. I mean, either for me, it's like either just fake, horrible, fake um, foods that are protein based, and we all know this. And if it's got birthday cake in, in the, you know, seriously, I'll want it. That's why she farts so much in the gym. <laughs> Sorry, that is definitely you, bro. But um, also, like, just seriously, like, I, I oatmeal. I just, like, want to have oatmeal before I train. Also, why she farts so much in the gym. God, I can't. But no, I lo- I I always default to like some type of potato chip, just because like pre-training that is so much salt and so easily digestible. Uh, it's I can eat like 800 calories in it and still be hungry, and then I'm it makes me thirsty, so I'm like fuck, I need to drink more water, and then I come in and I'm super hydrated and bloated and feel awesome. So that's why I always default to that some type of that. All right. Um, another one for you, Joe. What do you do for adductor health, rehab strength, and mobility wise? Uh, just retweak them over and over and over again so that they just turn into scar tissue, and then you'll n- never have to worry about it. That that's a joke. Um, but but I I have to I have to take uh, a lot of care. Uh, with my adductors especially recently i don't know it's very interesting because like over the past year and a half i've just been using the adductors way more frequently or feeling them more on my squat i don't know because that's i've primarily been competing in wraps and i've been trying to sort of like open my hips more or you i I don't i don't know it's a lot a lot of stuff to be considered there but uh i will you consistently both warm up and cool down with uh the copenhagen adductor drill uh which is basically just uh, a side plank with adduction of the legs um to wake them up and and the purpose behind that because it's not just, I see so many, I see a lot of people have reshared this over this, this movement over the past like year because it's gotten more and more popular, but so many people will do it and they'll be hunched over and like rounded and, and doing it. The purpose behind it is you are using the entire body as a system during the movement, just as if you were doing it as a squat. So you should prioritize your IAP, the intra-abdominal pressure and the, uh, the bracing first you should project the spine like you're squatting like you're deadlifting or whatever and then warm the adductors up because it's it's tying everything it's tying the body together as a unit while also actively warming the adductors up and i will do uh, a lot of single leg work a lot of unilateral work uh, because i tend to find that when i when i do that and i slow that down considerably I can get the muscles moving or get the muscles that I really need to be used to be used and uh, to be strengthened, to be strengthened. And that like it can be as subtle a change as the angle at which I place my foot or uh, which side of my foot I put pressure on, whether I'm pushing the foot down or trying to screw the foot in. Uh, But doing that unilaterally and focusing on control uh, because if I can't control it, like if I can't do a, a semi-assisted pistol squat, like as slow and controlled as I need to on my left side, as I can on my right, that tells me that there's an issue that I need to address on my left side. And then you go on to think about that. What's the adductor that I consistently uh, tweak? It's my left one. So maybe you can take data from that and then figure out, okay, I should probably do a little bit more for that side or focus on it a little bit further. <coughs> but single leg work in the uh, Copenhagen are are the bomb. And warm your glutes up way more than you think you should, or just use them better. Dave Janis, any thoughts on that? On- no, I just wanna I just wanna point out that if, if Joe was dealing with a quad tendon injury instead of the adductor, the whole answer would have been different. So it's He's dealing with a reoccurring issue, which part of what you said is true. You kind of want to keep scar tissue on there until after the meet because when it starts breaking apart is when re-injury can happen until you can give it enough time to completely heal, Mm -hmm. you know, and rest. So it's kind of that type of thing. But it's 
I'm only putting this out here because you don't want every, if people don't have that issue, you don't want them all doing that. If they, you need to address whatever your weak points are, weak points slash injuries. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's, if something's getting injured, it's definitely a weak point. So you address whatever that is. So don't, there's a lot of people that are afraid. Like I'm afraid I'm going to tear an adductor. So they're going to do all this stuff. All right. Well, at the same time, they're afraid they're going to tear a quad, so they're going to do all that stuff. And meanwhile, their upper back is weak as five. Mm -hmm. You know, so they got to focus on what you got to focus on. Okay. And uh, just another thing to think about is like, so if if it's my adductor, or if it's your quad tendon, or if it's your tricep tendon, or whatever, how do you how do you strengthen the integrity of like tendons or tendinous tendinous regions is like again read the textbooks it's it's rep it's high 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 reps so like 30 40 50 for like tendon integrity and if you like why do you think so many people will do the ba the band push downs like people do them because they see other people do them and then they're like okay everybody else does this i'm going to do that but why do you think the first individual was like all right i'm going to do 100 reps on the banded tricep pushdowns. It's not just for a wicked tricep bump. It's for tendon integrity because the people that applied that originally, the shirt adventures, uh, they they were fucking blowing tendons off the bone. So like, how the fuck do we get around this? Okay, we're gonna strengthen the tendons themselves. If your quad tendon has issues, you better be doing some slow and controlled and fucking killer number of reps, leg extensions or uh, sissy squats or what? What did we do the other day? The uh, fuck. Yeah, the TKEs uh, and those fucking isometric uh, sissy squats. Like, and it's just thinking like, okay, what is the purpose behind what I'm doing? What's the thing that I'm worried about? Or what is the issue? What's the thing that keeps getting the reoccurring injury that I'm facing? And how do you apply it? Or what do you use to help it? Or at least manage it going into a meet, depending on where you're at in the training cycle. Whether or not you expect to fix it or just sort of band-aid it until yeah. after the meet when you can fix it all right um what accessory or supplemental exercise was most surprising to being beneficial in bringing up your total and uh what did you learn and take away from this realization surprising that's what it says yep uh for me i'm I would say the good morning because it's when um, my early years of powerlifting, I was shown the good morning, probably part of my first training cycle. And I remember being told, don't ever use over 135, you know, just worry about getting the stretch, working the lower back, get the stretch, work the lower back. But this is don't, don't ever go heavy on it. And it just became like gospel, you know, just don't go heavy on it. And then when I left that gym and went on to, college and joined other powerlifting clubs i just kind of quit doing it all together i just didn't see the the, the need, or point, or need or the point of it and then when i came to west side and realized that at the time holy crap like 40 percent of all of our max effort work was good morning related I'm like this is stupid as fuck you know it's, we're not deadlifting ever and 40 percent is it um but then when i when i when we kind of we were working up to singles, so we kind of realized, I realized, I think, sooner. I'm going to brag a little bit because it wasn't doing shit, you know, when it, when it got heavier. And it, I couldn't get strong on it. But when I started backing the weight down and doing heavy sets of five with, like, 405, 455, I mean, it's that may seem heavy to some people, but it's, I mean, other people in the gym were doing 700s for five. So when I backed it down and just focused on five fives, everything everything even my bench everything just got better and it's just the the hinge and the hamstrings and and there's different ways to do it you know so that's the other thing with the good morning that that i realized is sometimes i put more force on my my heels and really work on trying to tear my hamstring off other times i let the bar get really close to getting in front of my toe you never really want it to go over your toes unless it's super super light and you're willing to take the risk but sometimes i let it get right about top of toe level and keep the weight light just to work the shit out of the back and rotate it through that one was one that i didn't think was going to have 
the impact that it did. I mean, other things you kind of like, gosh, you never really know for sure until afterwards. And it's like, well, this worked, but that doesn't mean it's going to work again. You know, the good morning was one that always, always had an impact when I put it, even now, if I put it in, it always has an impact. Um, I will say that I don't know. I somewhere in like the 2015, 2016 range for me, um, front squats actually seem to have an impact on my deadlift, which is already a strong lift for me my entire career. Um, there just seemed to be this interesting correlation between um, bringing in front squats, which I really like. That was really probably the most I've trained them like in my career is kind of around that time period um and it just suddenly like my deadlift shifted in a few different ways um I think technique wise a little bit and I just think like uh just in terms of that push that like initial push off the ground um and bracing um I think there were a lot of different reasons that front squats you know help me um but probably my crap bracing for 90 percent of my career because it's only now starting to I'm starting to solve certain issues with bracing that I didn't even know I had for like over you know however many years now so like that I'm guessing doing front squat work where you can't have faults in your bracing and as soon as you do at all then it goes to hell um which I still did by the way when I was doing them but like I I bet you money that that was a really pivotal kind of just introduction to my training while I had it in there um because it just probably forced better bracing than a lot of stuff was letting or letting get away with I, I will say so. and before I give my answer I would just say for both of you think about what those things were actually training and demanding of you what what you just said it forced you to keep your brace it's what it forced what, me to brace. Yeah, yeah what does a good morning do it forces yeah. you to brace it right. keeps your spinal integrity and it trains your torso that's the big that's the biggest thing that i think people could do uh in order to put pounds on their total or just increase their maximal strength is teach them how to actually use their torso not just fall through space with weight and then react to it but manipulate where the weight goes and because you can control how far that bar goes over your toe whether you're willing to have it go over your toe and you can dictate that and because you can identify like okay i need to keep that tension in the hole of the pause squat and actually use my legs to extend the ground away from me but keep my spinal integrity the entire time that is that's that's the biggest thing that i think people would be surprised at uh which is how the, like the question was phrased i don't think it's for us i think it's for everybody else like uh they training your torso in any way like train uh training your the actual shit around your spine to be rigid uh while manipulating weight and using that thing around your spine to dictate where that weight goes that's going to have the biggest impact on your total um and that's that's surprising to a lot of people but that's that's how it goes like we're made to we, we're supposed to be anti-fragile if we want to be strong so mm -hmm. how do you do that you build a bulletproof front and side and back around your guts and shit yeah but uh a huge thing that helped me uh or that had an extreme impact on my movement uh so my total uh biggest thing was my bench press uh is chest supported rowing and basically rowing horizontal rowing exercises for power lifting not just doing them to train the muscles but doing them to train my body to keep tension uh throughout a bench press through a squat through a deadlift because what do we always cue we cue shoulder blades in the back pockets or engage the lats and you can say that but people don't know what that means i've had i've had people come uh lee the other day was in here telling me that when he was under the bar when he was under the squat bar you know he has those rhomboid issues this is an individual that has been coming out to the gym lately he has uh this rhomboid strain or like this rhomboid upper back something whatever the fuck it is that keeps reoccurring and he's like telling me when he gets under the bar he's tensioning his lats he's tensioning his lats and i'm like okay but tell me what you're actually thinking about when you are tensioning your lats and he's like i'm trying to spread the bar that way and i'm like fuck okay cool don't fucking do that like some people 
yeah, you can phrase it that way because they're they're going they're going to go down and out to tension the lats, maybe or maybe on a buffalo bar or a bow bar or a duffalo bar or whatever they could do that. But I know for a fact Lee's not thinking about it in that way. He's literally just trying to pull the bar apart and it's restraining his upper back because he's trying to do a band pull apart with a fucking steel object. The shit doesn't work. So if you implement chest supported rows uh, or ro- or ro- just any type of rows and you're actually working to depress the lats or depress the shoulders by pulling the lats down and back, that's the positioning that you want to be in on almost every power movement that you do because it creates stability. Because the lat, if you look at, and this goes back to people learning and reading their shit, like read some anatomy books, read, read some anatomy and physiology books, because then you'll realize the latissimus dorsi muscle, the lat, inserts all the way down on the superior spine of your hip. That's a big fucking muscle. It's not just in your armpit. It goes down and stabilizes your entire torso. So if you learn how to control that and, again, use it to manipulate weight that you are moving through space, it's just going to create a a much better opportunity for you to be strong and to move that weight in general. I'd say when I, going back to your torso, when I competed, 50% of all movements I did were torso-related. Um, at Westside, we used to measure two things, uh, and the, these measurements always correlated to a bigger total, waist and head. You know, so the bigger the head, the bigger the total, the bigger the waist, you know, assuming that it's, you know, solid, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. um, hard, you know, the, the bigger the total. So if you, that's the, if you measure the waist and it goes down, like if you measured your waist now and it was four inches less than last week, you're going to be freaking the fuck out. Yeah. You know, because what the hell, you know, it's so those I don't think people focus enough if they're asking for themselves, they don't focus enough on that, even on simple things like, you know, if you're training triceps, you know, it's if if I had a preference between an extension, which is a great fucking exercise or some type of cable standing Mm -hmm. extension, I (laughs) want the cable standing extension, you know, because it's going to force them to contract the torso. So any little bit that you can slip in there, Mm -hmm. you know, especially for people that you know are not going to do the things that they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it would be reverse hypers, pull down abs, hanging leg raises, shit like that. You got to slip that shit in other places, which is going to cause them to statically contract the abs. Or like you said, with the good mornings and those things like that, where can it be put in there where that's the top priority? Mm -hmm. Because without that, there's no transfer power, bottom line. Mm Mm-hmm. Can I just go back to what they said at West Side and like the waist size thing, mm-hmm. the head size, but I'm, I'm more interested in the waist size situation. I, I really feel like that's one that I want to yell a lot, especially at women. I'm sorry, but I like, I get a lot of discussion on this and it's just like, dude, if you're going to do this thing that is like build actual real strength, I am sorry. You may not be able to have a wasp size waist. In fact, like, you don't want one. Mm -hmm. It is not going to protect your spine. And so the more solid, your goal should be like the more solid mass you have around your waistline. Like, hell yeah. Like if your back is just blown up so much that like it adds inches to your waist size, like good job. If your obliques are so enormous that that is adding inches to your waistline, good job. Same with everything else. Everything else 360 through there. Um, I talked to somebody a long time ago um, about doing physique. I was like, maybe I'll compete in physique. And she looked at me and she was like, "Uh, yeah, you're going to have to bring your obliques down. I was like, I remember just being like, I, what? Like you, in what world is that good? I mean, okay, obviously apparently in that world, according to her, but I was like, well, that doesn't, that seems some bullshit to me. So like, I didn't really want to go that direction, but can I just take a second to say something that at this point in time is somewhat revolutionary and say, if you're building your waistline 360, you're going to be a stronger lifter. And if that's what you're in this to do, if you're Mm -hmm. in there to be stronger and, and you're going to have to go ahead and take What you're hearing about like what looks good and like thin waist and all the stupid bullshit and be like, actually, if I if my goal is to be strong, then I have to delete that out of my like mental vernacular, like like my concept that I adhere to. So just please do that. okay? like a thick waist is okay in in this context. It's great to flip that to something that Justin was saying and that I've seen with bodybuilders, male bodybuilders, people that 
cross over from powerlifter into bodybuilding, the first thing they need to do is drop the pulls and drop the squats. Mm -hmm. And some people just can't say, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Well, then understand you're going to fucking get beat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that simple. It's like, I can't do that. I have to squat heavy. Well, Mm -hmm. understand that your fucking lats are not going to be that wide. Yeah. You know, it's, you got to find other ways to train the muscles. So you you can't have, unless you're not going to compete, you can't, if you're trying to be your best at what you're doing, Mm -hmm. you can't have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're going to be strong. You you need to have a thick waist or it's better to have a thick waist than, than, than a broken waist. Mm -hmm. You know, it's back pain is not fucking cool. You know, it's, that's why so many people have it. So forget about the total for a minute. It's, it's also injury prevention Mm -hmm. 101 that having that torso not only is going to protect you know, your back, but it's going to protect your shoulders from the tightness from the bench. Mm-hmm. It's actually protecting everything because when you squat, it's stabilizing the knees and everything else. So you got to build the shit out of it. It's just the way it is. And and we, we've talked about this. Like, you know, you, you just have that feeling when you have that pop, when you're that just extra little bit of fat. And it's not even fat. It's just like I feel fucking thick mm-hmm. today. And you don't even have to. You don't even have to think about squatting or brace. It. You're just like, okay, get my gut, get my gut tight, get Slayer. my belt here, and you're like, I could fucking do whatever the fuck I want today. Yep. You know, because it this translates everywhere else. There's a reason it's called the oblique sling. It's the shoulder ties into the trunk, the hip ties into the trunk, and then what ties into the hip and the shoulder, the elbow and the knee, and it just goes out and back in. And if you start with this. Just like the Copenhagen adduction drill, if you start with this and then do everything else, it's just gonna it's it's really a lot more difficult to fuck up if you have this locked in. Mm-hmm. So it's transfer power. Look at women yep. sprinters, Olympic mm-hmm. sprinters. Show me how small their waist is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know that's you know ana- anaerobic power at its the highest. Or gymnasts. Yes. You know. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's hit a couple of these live ones. You guys, can you guys see those on your screen over there? No. Nope. No. Nope. We lost the screen somehow. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with one here. It just says, do you do Zercher squats for Joe and Janice? Not. <laughs> um, I have. Um, Not. In the, in the distant past, I have. So that's all I got. I have two torn biceps. I yeah, would yeah. rather... Not do those. I have one torn bicep. I would rather not do that. Yeah. So, there. I've look. I've seen power lifters apply zercher squats in their training, and I've had clients ask me to do zercher zercher squats in their training, and I'm like, it's a matter of risk versus reward. And if you're not training for strongman, not training for stones, not training for anything like that, let's just do a different thing to train your torso where you run a smaller risk of blowing some shit off, you know, like that's, that's just what it's like. I I could do, I could do squats on a BOSU ball. Like there, there's a purpose for those. There are like training stability, like some athletes can do it. But if you're a power lifter that is seeking out stability, let's not do those, you know, like you're too strong for your own good. There, there. Let's do some single leg stuff. Let's do some fucking moving stuff. Some like a contralateral stuff. It's I don't do them. I wouldn't tell people to do them who are training for powerlifting just because you have too large a risk of fucking it up. Okay. Um. Let me see here. Yeah, the screen went away. A while ago. All right, my legs start to shake in heavy deadlifts when I get the bar on my on my knee level. Any good tips on how to fix that problem? I saw that exchange. Somebody in the in the comments up here or in here uh, told him to do block pulls from like two inches, and he tried, and he'll come back, and he'll still get he'll still have shaking uh, back at like once he gets to the max or semi max level. Um, it's hard to avoid a certain amount of shaking. Like I, I at, at maximal effort stuff or like high intensity stuff, your there's your it's power output, you know, and it's traction control. If you're 
not stable or if you run the risk of losing stability at any point, your body is going to be like, fuck, 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 you know, and that can be shown in shaking or wh whatever, you know. Um, I would say if it's an ongoing issue and he has it happen again and again, I would address his bracing and I would address his rooting. Look at his torso, look at his feet, um, and then look at his lats. If all those are locked in and you can't improve upon any of those, um, then just you might fucking shake a bit when you lock stuff out. I shake, I shake when I descend on the squats. Like, that's just how it goes. I can improve upon it um, because my, it's because my bracing gets stressed out. Like, my, uh, my deep hip flexors are always either tight or fatigued or whatever. Um, so training those, I can improve upon it a little bit, but I'm almost positive once I get to my maximal effort, like one rep max or near it, there's going to be a certain degree of shaking. It's just, it's just how it goes. It's, it's power output. Your body has a lot of energy and it's not always perfect at just putting it into the barbell and it can sometimes be exhibited going somewhere else. Okay. I, I get this question a lot and i can't answer it without seeing a video yeah because i need to know where it's happening what i've seen from the all the videos that i've seen and i would say over nine ninety percent is with most people that i'm seeing that are sending these which are intermediate you know beginners and so forth they are trying to arch their lockout instead of fuck their lockout so they're not pushing their hips forward at the right time. So I can't tell him that at mid-thigh, drive your hips forward because it may be too soon for him. Some other people, it, they need to start driving their hips forward when the bar gets to their knees. Other people, mid-quad, it's all a different position. So, and that position is definitely going to be before you start shaking. And this is assuming that you're shaking and the bar is against your legs. Like if your bar is three inches out in front of you, you have greater problems than, you know, that. But assuming that the bar is from your knee up against your legs, usually right before you start shaking, you should be trying to fuck, you know, drive your hips into the bar while trying to push your traps into the wall. And if what I typically see is people get to a point it gets heavy and then they start their butt stays back and they just start trying to arch the finish um this is like i said it's a really hard one to answer because i can't see it if i could see it i can sit there and say okay three inches above your knee think about dry humping the bar you know and mm -hmm. and with the things that joe said you still got to have the brace and support um, but typically anything that's going to be above knee there and, and le i mean unless it's, it's like super rounded like old school crossfit fucking make fun of videos you know usually they're pretty well braced because the weight kind of does it for them you know for that standpoint but that's that's what i would say there is you're probably not using your hips and you're trying to arch it up it's just a matter of when do you it, deadlift is a timing thing it's more of a timing thing than people make it out to be or give it credit to be some people just are genetically suited for it so the timing just kind of like falls into place other people have to really really fucking think about it and then there's a third group of people that to do it right it's going to be really weird and uncomfortable to be able to get the timing right typically the heavier the person gets the more vital the timing becomes like a super the timing is night and day it's a 200 pound difference on what they do when when's the last time you saw a super heavyweight grind a deadlift <laughs> they, they don't, it either time. moves and they lock it out or it's not yeah yeah okay um we got one the benches at my gym are low and narrow uh while i'm tall i am a tall and broad guy how should i adapt to this in my bench training due to life constraints moving gyms is not an option just about what you can do then you know um if floor press or no nah, uh, no i mean he can still bench it's just like if they're low and narrow and he's a tall guy like i've never i've i've never had to deal with that um but 
get used to benching like it's not going to be as optimal as it could be get used to benching with your feet further out in front of your knees a little bit get really fucking good at it get you like like i was talking about doing chest supported rows uh get your lats strong as shit and do like hold the contraction on some of your lat training like get used to having it locked in because you are going to have to be very very locked in on those types of benches or they will fuck your shoulders up. So just get your lats as strong as you can. Get your lats strong in both dynamic ways and isometric ways. Um, and then use your lats on the bench press as best you can. You know, And if you feel your form start to go at all on one of those benches, like it's not worth it to grind shit out on, on something like that. Because then you're going to get like your shoulder popped up and you're going to tweak some shit. And it, yeah, you might be able to throw a couple yoga mats over the top. And keep yeah. this, I'm talking yoga mats, not exercise mats, but the thin, I mean, we, we're talking a half inch at the very most. You might be able to throw a couple on there, but I agree with Joe. You're going to have to put your feet out in front of you. If you're a competitor and you're, and you're traveling and you got to get your bench in and you walk into a gym and that's all they have, I'm, here's what I did. I turned around and walked the fuck out. It was better to skip the workout and then to risk benching on something that's 15 inches tall and an inch and a half more narrow with barely any padding than it is to force myself through some speed workout. Just it's my pecs were always a problem and that was just a pec tear waiting to happen. So I just turn around, walk the fuck out and that's it. Day off, you know, it's, it's not worth training in a non-optimal environment if you're training for a meet. Now, he's got no other choice, so make the best out of what you can. But when your situation changes, make sure you select your gym based upon something that's got good equipment. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what programming style this person uses, but it, it kind of begs the you know the question of potentially just choosing, all right, like I'm just going to bring in variations that don't of pressing, that don't involve the bench, like a little more. Like once again, it's just so contextual, but it, I, I honestly probably, if I were in that position, I'd probably do that, especially in the off season. I mean, hey, like why not? Just just do more overhead pressing than like powerlifters are quote unquote supposed to. I'm being facetious right now, but honestly, in that position, in that situation, you might be healthier, safer doing so. Um, you know, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, yeah. I approached that question Same. as the, as they, he was a powerlifter. If Same. you're not a powerlifter, just don't bench. Yeah, just do <laughs> do something. Yeah, else. Don't, don't do something. Yeah. Use the machines. Do something. There's yeah. uh, you can train the chest many other ways. Yeah. Like how many? I fuck. I've I've said that a thousand times. Like if if I didn't compete in powerlifting, I wouldn't I wouldn't squat with a straight bar. I wouldn't bench with a straight bar, and I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't. Well, I probably would deadlift, but I probably deadlift off blocks with like straps or something, just to make it as cheaty as possible. So I don't know. It's like everything you do, That's Dave. What I do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's more fun, right? It's fucking way more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, you guys are all happier. On a sad note, or a more serious note, this will be one to end on. Um, how do you deal with personal issues such as loss of family members or something similar in an attempt to maintain some sort of training whilst dealing with that tragedy? Also, is it wrong to use those emotions accompanying such an event in training? Uh, what, do you, what are all your opinions on the matter? Well, it's been a year for me. Um, and or just advice. You don't have to dive into your no, own experience. I, I, I know. I understand. But I mean, like, I made a post about last weekend how I was fucking, like, practically had tears in my eyes before squatting because I have, like, a very emotional connection to music. And I was just, like, in a, I was having a thing uh, that day. And I don't know. I don't think that it's wrong to use those emotions as fuel. I think we use, we find, we use, a lot of different things is fuel sometimes. Like sometimes you come into the gym and you're like, fuck, I, I'm pissed off. Like I'm going to put it into this. I don't think the gym is therapy, but I think uh, it it sometimes has to be because it's very hard to separate your personal life from your lifting life because your lifting life is more often than not also your personal life. Um, so, yeah, it's... And it's like we talked about way, way earlier in the podcast. Like, you need to be able to focus for 10 seconds. You need to be able to shut everything out for 10 seconds. Or at least 
actively try to. And like, if that means you have to be mindful of your breathing, be mindful of what you're listening to, be mindful of what you're thinking about, then do it. But you have to work on that, uh, when you're in here, like, and, and the problem with life is that it ends. Everybody dies and that's sad sometimes, you know, but it's just, you have, you, you can either accept that or you can't. And even if you accept it, it doesn't, it doesn't stop it from hurting, but it can help. So. Um, my last two years have been kind of like complete hell, uh, at least last two years, I'm going to say. And like the first part of my power, I've been doing this for a little over seven years and the first part of my lifting career, um, up to like 16 or so, honestly, was like, my life situation was so different than the last two years. It has been bad. So, um... I will just say that, like, during that time period, man, there was multiple, multiple things where, like, I would need to, you know, I'm like, okay, I want to train for this, but, like, it, there was just stuff going on, and just as, at the end of the day, like, basically, I'm all, I always come back to, like, okay, just, like, keep going forward, like, the, the training is not going to be perfect, I, like, I don't care, like, if you just you know, go to the gym and do, like, the most... It, it just really ends up being a not very productive workout. Like, at least you just went and did it. Like, that's that's literally what I've done, like, this whole time and continue to do. Um, so I think people are just like, how do I keep... I think it's because you hold a picture. You're asking this question, or somebody might ask this question because they hold a certain picture in their mind of, like, what their training should look like, um, what their competition trajectory should look like, and then life happens, as we say, and it's, like, you need to adjust, you know, like, your your relationship with this, um, given that, and if you do, then you can still keep going, which is the bottom line, but you're just going to have to give it some leeway for a period sometimes, and that might be the difference between you staying in the sport um, or things just going to complete hell and you just ending up quitting, so just adjust yeah like i mean i i listened i listened to a couple of voicemails of my grandfather yesterday you know just because i was thinking about it and uh it's it's always going to be there and i mean it when 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 he passed away this past year like i i mean i i think i found out about it no i found out about he went into the hospital like at the beginning of a workout when I was in here and I just sort of like, I, I freaked the fuck out for a couple of minutes, but longer than that. But then I was like, okay, I need to get something done. I think I just did some like uh, considerably less than what I was written to do or prescribed to do that day, but I still did something, you know? And then the next day I was supposed to come in here, I still did something. And then even when he, even when I went to Florida to see him in the hospital, I still did something when I was down there. Um, it's just, e even if that means waking up and stretching one day, it's just still, still do something. Take, like, re realize again, like what we were talking about earlier, you can control what you can control, and you can't control what you can't control, but identify the things that you can control and then control the fuck out of them like own your shit like even if even if it's the hardest thing one day the hardest thing is to get up out of bed and then still get up out of bed you know do it you know and just take a step a little bit further every single day um and it's realize like give yourself some leeway too because it's never going to be perfect like it it's never going to be it's never going to be an ideal situation. Like the guy that said, I, I have a, I have a whole lot of life stress two weeks out for my meat. Okay. We all do. Fuck. Like you're, you're not special, man. Like, I'm sorry, but it's just, it's, it's hard and it's how it goes. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it's identifying what you can control and what you can't control and being, uh, being okay with, taking steps towards doing the things that you can control every single day and trying to do a little bit more every single day, but also allowing yourself to understand that that in itself is difficult and it's never going to be perfect, 
no matter how hard you try to do it perfectly, you can only get close. That's that's the nature of the beast of fucking life. You know, it nothing ever goes to accor- goes according to plan. Even if you get it close, it's not going to be perfect. It never will be. I mean, I do think we need to understand or remember that you get people who, like, for whom, if they have some crap going on, then, like, yay, I'm, the gym is, like, their way of handling it. You know, if they go in, it's going to, they know it's going to, I mean, it might be take some motivation, it might be hard, it might be screwed up, but they know if they go in, they're going to be like, yay, okay, I'm, like, able, I'm, like, kind of calmed down, it kind of calms them down. And then you do, I mean, so that's, like, one type of person, then you get, like, another type of person who, honestly... The, something blows up in their lives and like they shut down like they can't motivate themselves to do anything you know like there's that like depressive situation where like it feels like this hell to you know to get out of bed um so sometimes i think with this kind of question you have to kind of figure out where like how this training works for you um and then like cuz that's going to it's kind of going to be a different understanding of what you do with your training when periods of high stress and like tragedy and loss occur based on how you respond to trauma and that's once again that's not going to be the same for everybody so just you know remember this is not one size fits all for how to navigate your own you know struggle i think so yeah and it's just that's that's sometimes not a matter for yourself to decipher and then i could yell into the abyss again and again and again about go to therapy everybody talk to somebody about something ah you know but like it's it's also a matter of identifying it for yourself like how how you work and how um how Mm -hmm. each struggle uh is going to affect you and how you're going to respond to it it's it's a matter of knowing yourself so I, t- I tend to I, I tend to have to keep my emotions out of the gym otherwise I get way too far on the arousal curve and then I end up fucking hitting my head against a bar and like some stupid shit like that or throwing my belt or trying to I don't know just do just dumb shit like that you know it's unnecessary so it's it's just it's a matter of getting comfortable with knowing who you are and controlling what you can and just being like fuck it do the things you can't Okay. All right, why is it? Am I up? Yeah, if you want, or we can cut it there. Or, um, fuck it. All right, <laughs> I'm not the same person I used to be. So let me tell you how I used to deal with these things. Up until probably 2006. So let's just say. I I developed a mindset as a child to become very indifferent and very, I don't want to say not give a fuck, because when you say you don't give a fuck, you actually give a fuck. Being a person that is just oblivious, like here's what I got to do, this is what I'm going to do, everything else is irrelevant. I became very good at being that person, which helped immensely in powerlifting because the book under the bar that I wrote talks about all the qualities that you can use in powerlifting that carry over into business. There's a section, you know, a book that I probably should write, you know, racking the bar, you know, the qualities that don't carry over so well, the selfishness the the being locked in the one-sided you know one mind focus nothing you know it's that that was the epitome of me so west side versus the world take that times 10 so i never had a problem fitting in there you know so that that was not one of my issues so i had no problem with family members dying I had no problems with friends who would not want to be friends. I had no problems with really anything. I had no problems with flunking out of college. Like, fuck it, we'll just go to a different college. I had no, it it didn't, none of that fucking mattered. I had a bad meet that fucking mattered. You know, that, that's, everything was about the next meet or the next, you know, (coughs) 
weight class or whatever. Everything was powerlifting 100% with a significant drop into my real life. So those that have followed me on Instagram will have said many times, you know, when I look back, the only regrets I have are how I treated my wife and how I treated my kids. Um, they were there. You know, I was there. Let's just put it that way. You know, I wasn't abusive, but I didn't sleep in the same room. You know, when the kids were babies, I, st I needed to sleep. You know, I had meat coming up in 17 weeks or meat coming up. And my joke is I had a meat coming up in 37 weeks. So couldn't go for a walk, couldn't go to a movie, couldn't go to dinner, fuck all that. This is what I do. You know, so when you say 100% all in, you know, I take that literally. I know what that means to actually do that. And I didn't want to leave the sport um, thinking that I ever left anything on the table or on the platform because of some fucking choice that I made that involved another person or anything like that. But I was still wise enough to keep trying to chip away to move my life forward. So I was still wise enough to keep going to school, to get a job, you know, to try to have a family. But all those things were such a distant second that there's really no comparison. So that identity that was created was zippy. Let's put it that way. So there, there's a whole different person. And then that intensified when I went into the gym. So it took um, almost being divorced, you know, to... And having a best friend of mine who's passed get in my face and give me a reality check on who I really was. So it wasn't me looking in the mirror. It was somebody turning my head and fucking throwing it and forcing me to look in the mirror. And then explaining it all and realize, holy fuck, I'm a dickhead. You know, on major, major levels. So there was a lot of change that I had to make on how I perceive things and how I go about structuring things and one of my greatest fears you know running a business is if if i i know how to be in that place if i pivot and put myself in that place as a business owner i will lose my kids i will lose everybody around me that i know and i will lose my wife because i know what i will do when i get into that position because it is 100 percent all in so i've had to learn how to dial that back that sociopath, you know, mentality, I, to dial that back, which when I say things like to other people, you know, there's things you control, things you can't control. I have an innate ability to do that very well. You know, it's just boom, boom, gone, you know, and I take responsibility and accountability, but I also take ownership of it now because now I know how to use it. You know, now I can turn it on, turn it off. Before, I didn't know how to do that. It did take a little bit of therapy, so I am going to agree with Joe when he talks about his therapy thing. I'm not an anti-therapy guy. It took a lot of therapy to be able to understand why this all was the way it was. Now, with that in mind, because people think that's cool, you know, everything that I just said, that that's the way, yeah, fuck yeah, that's the way you're supposed to be, 100%. Like, telling you, dude, I live that fucking life. And when you shatter through that, and you come out on the other side and you see who you really are, no, you don't want to fucking do that. You don't want to do that because you don't want to look back and see who that person was or take ownership in that. It's better if you die before you come out of it because you don't want to look back because that's not who you want to be because it's not, maybe this is why I am so giving, you know, and passing on because it was so taking, you know, for so long you know, to be able to be that person that I had to be for a fucking 2,200 pounds tall. You know, it's, it's, you know, looking back, it becomes ridiculous. But when you're in it and you're caught up in that storm, you are the storm. You know what I'm saying? You're not caught up in it. You are the fucking storm that's tearing through everything, just ripping shit apart. So it is not, I could have been a better lifter had I known how to control that then let it control me. So I could have been a better lifter if I was a vessel in the storm instead of being the storm. If I learned how to let my wife actually help me instead of dictating how she should live. If I actually embraced my, you know, used the people around me to help propel me and make me better instead of 
being so self-absorbed and focused on one entire thing, I would have been a way better lifter. Statistically, maybe even a world record holder, you know, because I wasn't that far off for a couple of years that I was there, but far enough off that it was a significant difference. So looking back, it was my own commitment that actually held me back because my commitment was the commitment to the wrong thing. You know, I was doing everything that I could do. So now that I know how to use it and that there is situations that come up, I still will default. I can still turn off real quick. And when I do, you got to, it's, it's self-talk. When I turn off, why am I turning off? Da, da, da. But dealing with the death of a loved one, um, <coughs> my kind of both my mother and father my mom's still alive but my dad passing was rough because it was a long one so training how did it play a role there I'm, I don't at that time I still wasn't competing if I was competing I don't even I, I actually I do know because it was with my grandparents so we'll just leave that be and just say it was what you would think just shut off and not participating in any way um, with my dad you have to be there for those other people. I had to be there for my brother. I had to be there for my mom. I had to be there for everybody else. So to actually really be there when you're dealing with a sick, a sick loved one that's in the hospital, somebody's got to be paying attention because doctors will say things they won't do. Orders will be made that won't get done. Somebody's got to be able to fucking follow this shit because the highest, the number one cause of death, I believe, are fuck ups in hospitals. All right, so who's, who's doing this? You know, if you're relying on the nurses and so forth to do that, well, guess what? Your loved one may die, and that's just a fact of the matter. So you got to be on the top of your game, but I couldn't do that unless I could get away, and I had to get away and go to a gym. So I go to a gym. Sometimes it was just walking on the treadmill, but just getting in some place that is not there around the people that are dealing with all of it, to just separate and be turn kind of turn off but actually get blood circulating get my mind in a different place get different music going on in my head you know to be able to put myself in a different spot then go back and be able to be there for my family and be able to help them and to be able to pay attention so that's where it's not you're not training at that point in time if it's a loved one you're not trained for your fucking squat bench or deadlift if you are and it's a loved one, I would tell you to reevaluate if the meat is really necessary or worth it, you know, because or who's going to if that's if you're going to quarterback it, you know, if somebody else is quarterbacking it, and you just have to be there. That's one thing. So <laughs> from that standpoint, you have to understand that training is a break. OK, it's not your therapy it's not your release it's not how you help it doesn't help you deal with life it's not people can say whatever they want i've wrote i've written all this shit dude i've said all this i said all this 20 fucking years ago so don't tell me shit i've already fucking said 20 years ago and now i've been wise enough to understand i was fucking wrong it's not that and you want me to prove it if that's the case and you start to feel depressed at 10 30 at night do you get up and go to the fucking gym no if you're, if you're at home at 2.30 in the middle of the day, do you go to the gym if you feel depressed? No. The only time you have your therapy that's supposed to help you cope with life is during your regularly scheduled training days. Well, guess what? That's not how life fucking works. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't work that way. You have to have other ways to be able to cope. It's a break. So training is a break. So the advice that I can give from that standpoint is when you walk in the gym, try to put all that other shit out. You know, keep your phone because usually during times like that, you need to be, so you have to be connected. You know, if you got a loved one that's going through, you know, a hard time, you need you, you don't want to miss the call, right? You'll, you'll regret the fuck out of missing the call. So have that close by, but don't be checking your phone and, you know, 
Instagram and all that other shit during these times. Let the gym do what it's supposed to do, and that's to be a complete break away from everything else. And that means away from social media, away from the hospital, away from the family, away from the stress, away from the spouse, away from the kids, away from all the other stuff. Just let it fucking be that. Let the people in the gym be your friends. Let them be, you know, have fun, laugh, have a good time. Let it be a, a fuck, a, a real break. Then leave. Now, during times that aren't stress, yeah, fucking sure, post your shit up and all that other stuff. But during times under high stress, that's my biggest advice. Make the gym really be a break. So anything that's normally outside of the gym, leave outside of the gym. Even, you know, and that, that, that's it. Been, that go all in bullshit, you can still go all in and still be very fucking productive and move forward. And there's been professional players in every league around the world that have done it. So there's no reason why a fucking power lifter that only spends six hours a week training has to be 100% all in 24 seven. And it, it goes, <clears throat> it goes back to what you said earlier and what I built upon it's control what you can control and control the fuck out of it. And if you're in an instance where you're in the storm, you're getting blown around, you have the wife, you have the dying loved one, you have the kids that are driving you crazy, whatever, then you find something that you can control. You find that break, whether it's an, even if it's an hour, if it's 45 minutes, but you go there and you treat it as such. Mm -hmm. You control the shit out of it. So you make it your time away. It's not your therapy, your release, but you make it that break. You get out of it what mm -hmm. you need. And then you go back to whatever you're dealing with. Yes. Yeah. And that one hour or half hour or whatever it is, is you, you won't believe the difference. We, I mean, you're going to step right back into the storm again, but you're going to step back in like, okay, motherfuckers, mm -hmm. let's go. You know, and it, it's not as pounding because every day is just a little bit of a chip away. You know, so it's still going to chip away a little bit, but at least you're ready for it. You know, instead of just boom, 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 over, over and over and over and over. And then you get the ones that, you know, just will overtrain, you know, like, you know, it's like train like fucking a rocky montage, mm -hmm. you know, because things are bad. So, but you know, there comes fucking lunatic fringe again. Mm -hmm. You know, as I'm going to do a fucking, I'm going to do a, what do they call them? Fucking am wrap fucking like drops. Am 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 yeah. am they're going to do a fucking am wrap on their mm -hmm. squats and they're going to kill themselves. And dude, that's the worst thing that you can do. Cause your cortisol is already elevated just because of the life situation you're in. Mm -hmm. So then you're going to train yourself to even elevate it more. So, so you're going to make less gains. So your goal here is to actually make less progress, you know, and they're, mm -hmm. uh, no, within fuck. Why don't you just, you know, do what you control it and get the hell in and out. All right, we're good. Yeah, that was the uh, longest one to date. Oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. Oops. <laughs>